Blog Talk Radio. Peace and blessings, family. This is your good, humble brother, Bassim, representing the DMV area. And when I'm not holding down my mid-level position in corporate America, I'm tuned into the most respected debate show on the globe. That's Debate Talk for You with the esteemed host, Sal Showtime. Shalom Aleikum, Israel. This your brother, Zadok from Israel. Assistant teacher at the Congregation of Israel, the Knesset of Jesus, located in Buffalo, New York. We believe in the full, uncut word of God from Genesis to Revelation, and we seek to share the truth that the Holy Spirit has witnessed to us. So if you are interested in finding out more about our ministry, please visit us at www.congregationisrael.net. You can also find our teachings on YouTube under my name's sake, YouTube.com slash the Doc Ben Israel. Uh, we also have a page, Knesset Yeshua, K N E S S E T Y S H U A. You can also find us on Blog Talk Radio every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, on the Growing Stone Bible Study Show. Go to blogtalkradio.com slash Nazarene. And if you feel you just want to reach out and talk to us personally, call us 866 866- Seven eight Bible. Shalom, and we look forward to hearing from you. Peace and greetings to all. Uh, I'm a digital artist over at Epic Arts. In fact, that's my brand. Um, just to get right to the meat, uh, some current examples. And in fact, I, I consider them to be great examples. Of the work I do is the work I have been doing for Debate Talk for You for about a year now. So if you want to get a feel of like just the basic thing I do, um, you can have a look at Sal's gallery. Um, other things I do include book cover design. Um, so if you are an independent writer and you're looking for a unique book cover design, I'm the guy. Um, my prices are pretty fair. You know, they're, they're fairer than most, in fact. Uh, if you want more information on that or more information in general, uh, you can always contact me at epicdesigns at gmail.com. See, that's E P I K. Not, not with a C, guys. That's E P I K. So, and designs has a Z in it. That's D E Z I G N S. That's E P I K D E Z I G N S at gmail dot com. Holy greetings to you all. This is Minister DeAndre from Ads of the Promise Ministries. It's been a while since the debate talk for you artists has heard from me. That's because on this year. April 8th, 2015, I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, also called ALL. And also, I found out I had a, a chromosome called the Philadelphia chromosome, which meant I would have to have a stem cell bone marrow transplant. 
Well, through the Be The Match registry, worldwide registry, the doctors did find me a 100% unrelated donor, and I had that stem cell bone marrow transplant on July 18th of this year. And I'm proud to say, through the grace and mercy and healing power of the Most High, I am cancer-free. Hallelujah. Now I need you guys, the Debate Toffee audience, to go to my GoFundMe account, gofundme.com forward slash qz 4 S E B V C. That's go G O fund me dot com forward slash Q Z four S E B V C and give a donation and I would appreciate it. Uh, your love and support. I'm looking forward to coming minister to you guys in the near future. Peace and blessings to you all. Everybody out there listening in, this is Brother LeVar, co-teacher of Absolute Bible Truth Ministry. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge and give reverence and credence to the Father of all creation, the Holy One of Israel. Peace and blessings in the name of our Lord and King, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I want to take this great opportunity to invite you guys to the Absolute Bible Truth broadcast on Blog Talk Radio. If you love to hear the word or have any questions concerning the word, call in and dial 646-716-8249. That's 646-716-8249. We are live on the air every Saturday, the Most High's Weekly Sabbath, starting at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to listen in via internet, type in www.blogtartradio.com forward slash Absolute Bible Truth. We also have a Facebook page. Just type in Absolute Bible Truth, all one word, in the search engine. At ABT, we teach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth concerning the Word of God while leaving out all personal opinions, speculations, and beliefs. Our ministry believes emphatically that the Bible is indeed the absolute truth, and we pride ourselves in bringing forth the Word in a clear, intelligent fashion so that the body of Christ will be edified in abundance. I love you guys. Pray our strength in Christ, and we will do the same for you. Shalom. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, brothers and sisters. This is Brother Stanley of Sin No More Ministries here to encourage you all to support Sal's Showtime on Debate Talk for You. Those that have been shown support, you have been such a blessing to this powerful ministry and so much that this show is still on the air because of your heartfelt love gift. For those who are unable to give, we are still praying that you reach down into your pocket for $1. Yes, that's exactly what I said. I said $1. That same paper that you use for that vending machine. Amen? That dollar will make so much of a difference in this ministry. If you go to PayPal and set up your account, you can do it in so much that they can only reach out $1 every month from your check. You won't even feel it. And the show will stay alive on the air because of you. You'll have such powerful debates every week for years to come. So go to www.paypal.com, then use the email debatetalkforyou at gmail.com. That is debate. Talk number four and letter U at gmail.com to donate. God bless you all. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. All praises, all honor, all glory to the supreme intellect of the universe. This is Nasi Yashuva of Shom Reha Torah in Atlanta. And if I'm not reading my Torah or suplexing some false deity, I'm listening to my man, Sal Showtime, and Debate Talk for You Radio. Beautiful. Keep doing the good work, brother. Bring it forth.
Shalom Debate Talk for you, family. This spring, when you're planning your family gatherings, be sure to purchase Tupperware, kitchen storage wear, and appliances for those special occasions of building memories with your loved ones, keeping your favorite foods fresh for the spring. And don't miss out on the chance to win a 32-gigabyte Kindle Fire HD with any eligible purchase made up until April 21st. Be sure to take advantage of this offer and great deals at www.shopfortupperware.com. That's S-H-O-P-F-O-R-T-U-P-P-E-R-W-A-R-E. Make healthy meals and beautiful memories. Shalom. This is Renald Francois representing from Atlanta, Georgia. And when I'm not busy in the studio, I'm checking out Debate Talk for You Radio. Keep up the great work, Sal Showtime. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to another show. And now listening to season six of the Bay Talk You Radio. I'm your host, Al Showtime, and of course we are back with the relationship challenge along with my host, Amona Yisrael. Let me see if she's on the phone line. Amona, if you're out there, you gotta press number one. I can bring you on the phone line. Press number one. All right, there we go. All right, this is the founder of uh, TRC, Amona Yisrael. Welcome to the show. How you doing? Ah, shalom, brother Saab. Shalom to all who are out there. I'm doing well. All praise be to the Most High. It's been a wild day, but I'm glad for this conversation. I look forward to hearing what can be brought out today. So definitely, I'm doing well. All right, and today's show is actually entitled, Is It Better to Marry Than to Burn? All right, once again, today's show is entitled, Is It Better to Marry Than to Burn? Um, I'm wondering, you want to give people a brief, uh, you know, Analysis about why you uh, presented this topic? Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, uh, after you've been the last two, three episodes, you will hear that basically we're hitting some topics that you hear often. You know, these are uh, justifications that are given for certain type of behavior, and we want to just put a microscope on it or a magnifying glass and begin to look at these thought processes and see if it's righteous or unrighteous, see if it's beneficial or not. And so tonight, I know the title, people must be like, what, buried to marry than to burn, but we didn't make it up. It is in um, the New Testament, in the book of 1 Corinthians 7 and 9. So for those who are joining us, we're going to look at the context of it. We're going to look at what it's really talking about, and is it valid for us in this day and time. So definitely, I look forward again to the conversation. All right, so we're going to get this thing started. And I'm going to let you guys know early what next Monday's show is going to be. Again, we do the show every Monday, the Relationship Challenge. Uh, next show, next Monday is going to be the 21st. Uh, it's going to be Volume 4. And the topic of discussion will be, Did the Messiah Abolish the Law of Divorce? So that's next week, Monday. Did the Messiah abolish the law of divorce? So that's going to be a pretty interesting topic as well. And, again, we're going to do this every single Monday. So we appreciate the support out there on social media, on YouTube, uh, things of that nature. But let's go to the special guests. You know, we have four special guests today that's going to be joining us. And, again, if you want to be a special guest, send me an email at debatetalkforyou at gmail.com. You know, anybody can come on. If you want to speak about certain topics, we can get you on as, as well as the callers out there. If you want to chime in, you know that number, 646-716-7320. All right, so let's go to the phone lines. All right, my first brother is up. This is uh, my one and only brother right here, Water Swordsman. He's been on the show for years. Welcome to the show, my brother. How you doing? Big brother Sal, how you doing? And shalom to the sister. I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Anything that you've been uh, doing that you want to notify the people? Anything uh, coming up? Any projects? Anything like of that nature? You can let them know. Go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a, a powerful show coming on. Remember, I was telling you about the, the show called The Real New World Order. The reason I was taking long, I had to order a new computer and get uh, yeah. this uh, software. So I'm getting that tomorrow. It's going to be a powerful show I'm going in. Y'all may read about me in the newspaper because they're going to arrest me, but it's going to be a powerful show. So look out for that. It's called The Real New World Order on YouTube. <laughs> uh, that's why they call him the Water Swordsman, you know what I mean? <laughs> Putting that sword out there. I got you, brother. And welcome to the show, man. We appreciate you. Um, let's go to the next special guest. Uh, it's 972-302. Who am I speaking to? Um, my name is Eunice Mason. Hey, what's going on, Eunice? How you doing? Welcome to the show. 
Oh, I'm good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking All forward right, look, to people are getting in on this topic. This is going to be a nice. Yeah. All right, give the people a little brief bio about yourself. I mean, that it's your first time on the panel. Okay. Um, yes. Um, basically, um, I I am a Hebrew Israelite, and um, I make Facebook videos, and um, a lot of my videos are being spread, hopefully, throughout the Hebrew Israelite community as well as the rest of the world. Um, and I recently made a video um, entitled it, um, Is Fornication the New Marriage? And of course, in it, I, you know, explain some things that was going on with our community and with our people who are taking fornication as being the new marriage. And then Sister Imunia, she she reached out to me and asked me to um, if I would be willing to come on the show and speak about, you know, the content of what I put in the video. So here I am. All right, well, we welcome you to the show, and hopefully you become a regular, get you a little more often on the panel. And I've got to check out some of the videos you got up. Do you have any YouTube pages you want to put out there where your videos yes, are posted? Yes, um, I, do, yeah. yes, I do have some on YouTube as well. Um, my YouTube page is Eunice Mason, so if you type it in, you'll be able to see, you know, my collection of videos as well. And on Facebook, um, I, my page is open to the public, so there are some on my page as well. I will definitely check it out. Once again, I appreciate you being on the panel right here on the Bay Talk Radio. Uh, let's go to the next special guest, uh, 817301. Who am I speaking to? 817301. Who am I speaking to? 817. Are you there? Uh, call this drop, actually. Okay. Uh, let's see who this one is. 718309. Who am I speaking to? This is Mayana. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Oh no, nothing. Just thank you for um being on the panel again. I'm happy to be with with um family again to have these important conversations. Yeah, what about you? Anything that you want to let people know about? Any channels? Any YouTube channels? Things of that nature? You can go ahead and promote that. No, sir. I don't have anything in the work at the moment. Uh, we need we need you to get some videos <laughs> you know, that, that knowledge you're putting out there is powerful. You know, what I'm <laughs> we appreciate that. Though you get on the panel with the Bay Talk Radio, I'm actually missing one of my brothers, man. Uh, Yama Yama uh, Yama Rahu. I'm gonna have to call the brother up behind the scenes. But well, what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna have course Amuna. You know, she always starts off the show with uh, you know letting everybody know the information that she researched on a particular topic. And everybody's phone line is open. But do me a favor, if you have any noise in your backgrounds, just mute your mic. You know, I'm gonna leave all your mics open though. And uh, Mona, you can go ahead uh, Once again, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today And I hope our other special guest tunes in to, As you see the topic of the conversation Is it better to marry than to burn? And today we just wanted to open it up And really um, look at the context of what Paul was saying And putting, I know this could be touchy territory Because it uh, depends on how we approach the scriptures To see whether or not it's advice Whether or not it's commandment and what was actually going on in the time. So what I researched basically as we did, I think it was last week, as we spoke about the Church of Corinth that Paul was founding, there was some dissension within it, um, and there were certain things that was written to him that he was trying to address. And one of them he prefaces is sexual immorality that was um, taking over the church, and he made uh, he made a statement concerning men um, laying with their father's women. And so it illustrates earlier on in the chapter that this is something that should not be happening. Uh, as far as he goes on, I think it's in, in, the, in chapter 7, he's speaking now directly to um, as it relates to sexual immorality. And this is where we want to pick up here just by giving that quick snapshot. And definitely if any of the other guests have something to add to that, it will be greatly appreciated. But that snapshot I think is often not told when, when it is being said, you know, it's better to marry than to burn. And what we're seeing is a lot of people, uh, the minute they come into the truth, the truth with quotations, you know, all of a sudden now i got to look for Ish. All of a sudden now I have to look for Isha. Is it because they're, mar- they're burning with passion or lust? Is this a good thing? Does that need to be dealt with before you, as- before you actually get someone? Um, he was speaking to the fact that they lack, not my words, his words, that those people, he says, but if they do not have self-control, 
So he's alluding to the lack of self-control and it leaning to this fornication and all of the things that are going on in the church. So how should we be looking at this? Like I said before, is it valid? And, and where do we go from here? Because, again, a lot of people are falling into men and women and becoming hard and harlots because they're feeding into this narrative. Okay. So I'll open it up at this point. Um, I'll start off with Sister Mayana and see if she has anything uh, to add before we definitely get in to this uh, portion of the conversation. Okay. Okay. That, I'm going to um, just... I think that one of the things that might be valuable going into this particular lesson is that we consider the fact that although this particular letter is called the first letter to the Corinthians, it's obviously not the first letter to the Corinthians because uh, of certain internal evidence. We find that Paul makes the statement that um, as he had written unto them before, so we know there's a previous letter. So we don't know really the content of that previous letter, but whatever he said to them then, they wrote him back with certain concerns. And that's why we're now um, finding Paul having very specific things that he wants to address. And as you already said, set everything up for us, it's not that this is coming out of nowhere, that the churches and courts are dealing with very specific issues. And, again, letter to Florence that we're dealing with now, although it's called the first letter, is indeed not the first letter. There's at least one other letter before it. And and so I just wanted to kind of make sure we had that understanding going forward, that this is not um, something that Paul is saying, you know, what is Tuesday, let me put you guys up on game. It's because they're coming to him with very specific questions about um, whether it's, whether widows should re- remarry, whether or not um, marriage in general is important, um, what's better, uh, celibacy or married life. If they were already married, then what should they marry unbelievers? All these things are issues that that church is coming into, um, is confronting in their congregation. So that's where we find Paul having these conversations. And as we interrogate the internal evidence and the language in, inside of the um, letter itself, I think they will be able to bear out that this is a very specific um, instance and the way that we're, it, it gets reproduced in modernity, the way it, it gets given to us now, oftentimes is uh, a bit misguided and misplaced. So I'm glad that we're having this conversation so that we can flesh out those uh, misinterpretations. All right, thank you for that one. Um, a brother, uh, uh, Award Swordsman, are you on? Would you like to uh, start off the conversation with your thoughts just off the surface concerning this, uh, this, this teaching or this doctrine? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, uh, the first thing I want to do is ad- address the condition of the people during the time of Paul and them. Uh, before the arrival of John the Baptist, which uh, the prophecy says is going to bring the people back to the Most High, I want to examine that first so we can get a clearer picture of what was going on and why these letters had to be written and why they addressed the other brothers in these different churches and why the brothers had these questions. I'm going to start over with Isaiah 16 and 2. It says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. So this was the mindset of the people. They were in gross darkness. That's one aspect. Then I'm going to go to Hosea 3, verse 4. It says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice and without an image and without an ephod and without a a teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God. And then I'm going to go to this part. This is another condition and mindset of the people. This is 1 Maccabees uh, 1, verse 11. It said, in those days went there out of Israel wicked men, who persuaded many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the heathen. So that was going on. They were doing the customs of the heathen, okay? They went away from their customs. So the gospel was there. It was bringing people back into the original will of the creator. So that 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 what was going on during that time. A lot of us were following the way of the heathen. I'm going to read it again. It says, In those days went there out of Israel wicked men, who persuaded many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the heathen that are round about us. For since we departed from them, we have had much sorrow. So this this device pleased them well, 
Then certain of the people were so forward therein that they went to the king who gave them a license to do after the ordinances of the heathen. You have the same process going on today. That's why uh, they legalized uh, gay marriage and all that. The same thing's going on today. Nothing new under the sun. Then it says, whereupon they built a place of exercise at Jerusalem according to the customs of the heathen. Well, those gymnasiums weren't like they have today. They were butt naked with olive oil. That's how those gymnasiums were, okay? And then it says, and made themselves uncircumcised and forsook the holy covenant. That's what they did, okay? The law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. Then it says, and joined themselves to the heathen. That's going on today. We're in the beginning periods of all this immorality you see going on today. This is the beginning period of that stuff. This is where we got this stuff from. It's in, ex- in existence today. I'm going to read it again. And made themselves uncircumcised and forsook the holy covenant and joined themselves to the heathen and were sold to do mischief. What was the mischief? The fornication, homosexuality, menage uh, 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 trois, uh Orgies. They were doing all these things. So let's let's understand that. And then uh, later on, I will go on. That's why Paul had to address these things. The gospel was, was bringing the people back to the original plan of the Creator. Okay, because we lost our way. But that's all I'm gonna say on that. Wow, did did brother Awar say butt naked with olive oil? That was wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Eunice, um, uh, welcome once again to the show. Thank you for taking the invite. Um, have you heard this doctrine as it is that when you're relating to our community? Have you heard this as a reason to, uh, for many of the women or men to enter into covenant? And um, what basically has been your experience with the use of this doctrine or the misuse thereof? Um, the, the, the main thing that I'm hearing is, I mean, yes, like we said, like the brother, he, he hit it, you know, straight on. Um, but the biggest thing that I'm having a problem with that I am seeing that's infuriating me probably more than anything is that, you know, they always said the house of Israel, you know, we we can take it to the lowest level. But now what they're doing is they're they're actually sleeping with these women and having sex with them and telling them that because they have sex, now they're married. So now sex is marriage. And so what's happening is that you've got all, all of these unborn babies that are being, I mean, un, um, babies that are being born out of wedlock. You have some of our Hebrew Israelite brothers who are taking extra women into their houses, having sex with them, and telling them that now you're my wife. So some of them are having two and three women in their houses that they're laying up with and have not even married these people but are brainwashing these women into thinking that they are married. And then I get the phone calls from the crying women when the brother uh, gets tired. He throws them out and says, well, I'm through with you because basically it was all about sexual lust and desire. And they're they're literally um, breaking the spirit of the daughters of Zion who are trying to learn of this way. And they see a few things that are in the Old Testament the scriptures and then say, yeah, now you're my wife because I've laid with you. This is what I'm seeing. you know. And so now we have to define, sadly, what marriage is. Because the scripture says that in the last days that people will be forbidding to marry. And because they're forbidding to marry, they're saying we're well, better off sleeping with you and having sex with you and then convince you that we're married. And then when we're tired of this, we can just walk away and go find another victim. That's what I'm getting. And that's mm-hmm. why I make it Wow. So, again, from what we're hearing from Sister Eunice, it's a compilation, and we, we covered that uh few episodes ago concerning the name with the woman maker your wife. And so what I'm hearing you say is that within this other erroneous doctrine that is encouraging them to say, hey, you know what, it's better to marry than to burn. And because you have another doctrine waiting on the other side that marrying equals laying with you, it compounds the issue. And so once she's no longer, quote, unquote, burning or he's no longer burning with passion and there is this false pretense that they're married and they're really not, and then it becomes a bigger mess. Um, yeah. Brother Brother Sal is the other uh, brother on the line, or Brother Sal? I don't know where Sal is. All right, Sister Mayana. Um, 
have you had any experience with the combination as Sister Eunice is uh, bringing forward this combination of these erroneous doctrines coming together to make a kind of hodgepodge of, of fornication and sin, <laughs> for lack of a better word? Have you had any experience with this um, in your ministries? Absolutely. There is a, a real kind of agenda to get in where you fit in. They're going to um, take all kinds of verses and create a patchwork to support a particular ideology that doesn't exist in Hebraic thought. As a sister has um, brought up again, and you and I addressed Stanley a couple of weeks ago, the the idea that a man can bring nothing more than his penis to the table and move his way into a holy covenant is something that has, um, has brought itself uninvited into our Hebraic narrative. And now we have all of these women who have been discouraged from studying it under the guise of being humble and waiting for their king to teach them. They have been taught incorrectly, and now they have all of this bad information. And consequently and predictably, they have made bad decisions, and now they're in bad situations, uh, all because none of these things have any Hebraic foundation. So, yes, things like, oh, you know, it's better to marry than to burn. Um, all things are righteous in a, in a marriage belt undefiled. I mean, they, all kinds of things come when you disconnect them from context and put them together in a particular framework to support a particular objective. Then that's what's going on right now with all of these women who are like, yeah, the brother totally said, you know, we can do whatever in the marriage bed undefiled. And it's better to marry than to burn. You will have women who will co sign to owe. Men, men naturally have a, a lust for other women, and, you know, it's better for him to have a, another woman and tell you about it than to sneak behind your back. Okay, see, it, it, there's a lot of this um, type of acceptance going on, and speeches like it's better to marry than to burn is used to substantiate that approach. When we know, for example, um, children... Children will go into a store and see candy and they and take it. That's what they they don't have any idea of boundaries and they're at a point in their life where they're they they are being taught how to control their vessels, to control their impulses. We don't let our children uh, act on all of their impulses, and yet we make excuses for adult men saying, "Well, if he has a lustful nature, of course we should we should um, enable that." lustful nature rather than encourage him to have some kind of control over his impulses like an adult, the way we train our children to have control over their impulses within the, the normal framework of morality and, and integrity. And, yeah, so uh, bringing it back to this particular scripture, this particular scripture has been used or misused to the purpose of excusing bad behavior. Wow, I heard some very, right, very interesting. Oh, there yeah, we I'm go, sorry brother. About that. I'm back on. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I got actually uh, brother Kevin get ready to uh, call in. Brother Kevin, uh, the other brother I invited, basically, uh, <laughs> phone was disconnected, but like that. <laughs> so he couldn't make it in. But I got brother Kevin calling in right now, and I see we have a lot of people listening to the show. So again, if you want to chime in, you know that number six four six seven one six seven three two zero. I just want to let the people know that. But uh, go ahead, I'll bring in brother Kevin in as soon as he calls in. You guys can go ahead with the conversation. Uh, okay, I just want to say I heard a lot of things brought up there. Um, is it fair to say on the table because we might have, you know, this thing where it's man against woman? Is it not only is it only the man and his lust that is coming and um, enticing the poor maiden, or is there a reality that there are women out there who also cannot control their desires and are looking to let what's the word I'm trying to look for? Convert what they used to do before they woke up to this truth into their narrative now. You understand, if you can understand what I'm saying. So basically transferring it and using the mm -hmm. scriptures. And so the question is, are these men telling the women anything that they don't want to fall for? Not or at all. is it secretly within them that wants to believe this narrative? Oh, I absolutely agree to that. Oh, go ahead. I definitely um, will say this. I have had women that have called me that have been, that have been married for a while and they have came, them and their husband has come into the truth 
and because they've come into the truth, they've come in contact with other women who, quote, unquote, are saying they are in the truth and have told the husband that, you know, now you can take a second wife. And so I'm getting married women that are literally finding their homes being ripped apart because of thirsty women that want to get in there and want to be a part of the whole thing. Sometimes these brothers are not even thinking about taking a second wife. They already have a wife, but then here comes a woman who's telling them, well, you know, I can be a second wife to you. And so I'm finding marriages where people have been together for years are starting to break up over this. So, yes, you do have your succubuses. That's what I call them, your oh, succubus, no. the sirens that are are trying to also pull themselves into this, this bed of lust where the brother may not even be thinking about it. Now she's come and enticed him into saying, hey, now, you know, you can have me too. Not only can you have your wife, but you can have me too. I'll be your concubine. Hmm. Brother Awong, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Have you crossed that? Is there something, uh, there's truth in it in, in your walk, in your experience? Please go ahead. Right. Um, well, what I want to address first, let's address marriage, and then let's address the burning what the burn mean, because that's the problem. There's no fear of the Most High. Like I said on the last previous shows, this law, this Bible, give all creations rights, okay? You can't just get with a woman, get your rocks off, and leave her. There's a judgment for that, and we're going to read it. So let me go to marriage first, and then we're going to get understanding of what it means by the burn. This is uh, Deuteronomy 22, 28. It says, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her, and they be found. Wait, I'm sorry. Let me start at 29. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the... Well, let me read it again. I'm sorry. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver, and she... And then it says, and she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her. See? Then it says, he may not put her away all her days. This is a law. So when a man, you deal with a man, before you deal with him intimate or whatever, or you want to be with him, you better make sure he understands this, that he cannot put you away. Okay? It's forever. Till death do you part. That's the mistake a lot of us make. We didn't understand this. Then I'm going to go to the, the burning. Okay? I'm going to read... Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 9, it says, But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than burn. Let's see what this burn is talking about. This is Second Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that therein shall be burned up. That's the burden it's talking about. There's a judgment for that, okay? That's why when we go here to Matthew, let me just get this right quick. I mean, well, let me go back to Corinthians, what Paul said in the first verse. He said, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's the reason why Paul said that, because it's death if you leave her. Or like I said earlier, what was going on, you had so many men sleeping with these different women because... The woman, that, the first man, that woman, according to the scriptures, that's that woman's husband, and they're supposed to be together for, for till death. So if a man sleep with a woman, technically, if a man sleep with a woman that's been with a man before, you sleeping with a man's wife. That's the original custom. So that's why it's so dangerous to do that. That's why Paul said it. If you can not be with a woman, a, but some of us can't deal that way. That's why he said take your own wife. Meaning, don't get a wife that's been with a man and have your own wife. She's a virgin or going, going according to the protocol in Deuteronomy. That's why, in the proof, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the correctness. It was addressed. That same thing was taught by the King of Kings, the Son of Man. This is Matthew's 19th chapter, and I'm going to give it right back to you all. This is Matthew's 19. Look what he said. This is Matthew, the 19th chapter. It says, uh, this is Matthew 19, verse 7. It says, They said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a written writing of divorce and to put her away? He said unto them, 
Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So from the beginning, you're not supposed to put your wife away. You're supposed to be with her till when you die. Then it says, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, meaning your wife goes sleep with another man, and shall marry another. So if you put your wife away and go get another woman, you know what it says? It says, it says, except it be for fornication and shall marry another, commit adultery. It says you commit adultery. Why? Because that's not the original plan. Okay? Then it says, and whosoever marry of her, which is put away, do commit adultery. So if you take a woman and she wasn't a virgin, that means she was another man's wife. Okay? And you deal with her, you commit an adultery. That's why I'm showing you. The gospel brings us back to the original plan of the creator. And we've been deceived. We've been taught you could just go get another one, get this one, get that one. And I'm going to give it back, but after that I want to, I want to get true understanding on fornication and hormone. I'm going to show you what it is according to Scripture. But that's it I'm going to say on that. Very, very interesting. That was Brother Water Swordsman. I heard some uh, interesting perspectives on something that we're going to touch in uh, actually next week as, a, as it relates to divorce and things of that nature. But what I did hear you say concerning the burning, um, you went to, I believe it was Second Peter, and, I, and I, for me I was like I thought the burning had to do with passion and lust and not able to control yourself. So I'm not really sure right there, but I'm going to give it over to Sister Mayana and hear what she received from that. I want to thank you once again, Brother Aswa. Sister Mayana, what are your thoughts uh, concerning, and what are your thoughts on what exactly that burning is as it relates to marriage? And should people marry just because they're burning? Well, um, regarding the actual verse uh, in question, it's absolutely dealing with controlling one's vessel because he speaks to saying if you cannot control yourself and this is what you have to do. It is necessarily speaking to um, reining in one's urges and controlling one's impulses with regard to all of the other extrapolations that are uh, uh, awar attached to the conversations between um, the Messiah of the first century and those who were questioning him. Um, you know, there, there are a few things that are a bit problematic about those conclusions, but I think it's better suited for us to really kind of interrogate those in our next session. But what I would like to say is that we need to be very clear that the penalty in Torah for adultery is not that you get a brand new shiny spouse. So the idea that you can only uh, divorce your spouse under the guise of, of, of uh, adultery that's not that's not consistent with Torah. If you commit adultery, you die. So you're pretty much okay. You're pretty much eligible for the next person anyway because your spouse is dead. There, uh, in the Torah, there are two steps that need to be done in order for a divorce to be successful, and that is that he must give the rich of divorce plus remove the person from the house. You cannot have... Um, uh, the woman still residing in your house, neither can you send her outside of your house without that written have uh, successfully severed that union. The same two steps are present in the New Testament, but we'll go over that next week. Instead, what's important to understand is what Paul is talking about here is not uh, adultery. Uh, he's not talking about uh, divorce. He's actually talking about whether or not we should marry. Um, so, and, and I think that to talk about all of the many facets uh, surrounding marriage, I think to be, because we probably have a very limited amount of time, we should probably stick to what's actually being discussed and what Paul is talking about, is um, marrying instead of engaging in lustful behavior or engaging in other things. It's interesting that he he speaks to, uh, for actually speaks mostly to, what is it, the widows and the unmarried women, and he says to them, and what was it, the fifth, the fifth chapter or the, or the seventh chapter where we are now, that it's better to marry, that it's better that they be unmarried, like him. And then he also says somewhere else that it's better to marry than to burn. And then to kind of understand what is Paul talking about and why are these marriage situations seemingly conflicting in terms of how he feels that these things should be approached. And I think that would be 
better for us to spend our time kind of really interrogating what is it that Paul wants the people of Corinth to do? Because he gives the advice of, and it's very important because it ties into our last conversation last week where the conversation was organized around if a woman is uh, has any questions, she, according to uh, what they were understanding about Paul's letter, that if she has any questions, she'd ask her husband at home. And then Paul forwards this really weird um, kind of counterpoint saying that, the unmarried women and will shouldn't marry at all. So they don't get married at all. So who are they asking these questions? Because he's he has removed the possibility of having a husband to speak to in that scenario. And then again, we have this scenario where he's encouraging marriage. So we have to kind of figure out what exactly, what context are we talking about? Why why is he giving what seems to be contradicting advice? And how? What, what, what exactly are we supposed to gain from what Paul wants this church to do? Does he want them to marry? Does he want them to not marry? And that's what we really have to um, find the answers to. And there's a lot of things happening in Rome and in Greece at that time. So whereas it, it, it is valuable to understand that throughout history, Israel has a, has a habit of breaking away from our culture. I mean, this is not new to the first century. So, yes, we can go into Isaiah and um, Hosea and, you know, Ezekiel and all over the place and look at all the ways that we have departed from the culture because that's going to happen throughout time. But we can always be the, like, you know, one, you know, one size fits all, fits just all of the time. I can always go, yeah, look, Israel is out of order. Israel is perpetually out of order. But that is not necessarily what Paul is talking about in this context, and I think that we're missing um, dealing with the con- the cultural context of this time by by blanketing, giving the blanket synopsis of Israel is out of order. Israel is always out of order. But why is Paul saying this now? What are the laws in Rome and in Greece at this time that Paul finds this important? Like these are the things that we need to flesh out so that we can say, okay. When we use these scriptures, we have to under. Well, we use these excerpts from these letters. We have to understand that context so we know when, where, and how to apply them. And what significance they have for us now? If they're contextual only for that time and space, dealing with those laws and those conditions, and we need to know that. If it's something that has some uh, overarching significance, then we need to understand that too. So I think that what we want to do now. It's really think about, okay, what is Paul saying? Why is his advice here it's better to marry when he has, other, he has in other occasions said it's better not to marry? So we need to know what's going on. Correct. Um, I would like to mention uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 that to be able to say some things. Um, yeah, right, yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to bring to the attention that, okay, we're saying that it's better to marry than to burn. And so the, the the situation is going on. I do as well take the the word burn as being lust or burning in passion or being sensual because there's other scriptures where he actually called them sensual beast. And so what you, what you have to understand is that in First Corinthians seven and two it says nevertheless. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So in, when, when, when you have these people that are burning and that are in lust and having these sexual urges, he's saying rather than, than, than go through that, then get married. And, and rather than to go into fornication, he's saying let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. This will counteract the whole act of fornication. Because he knew that, you know, hey, we're flesh. There's, you know, the Most High did make us to to have these urges to procreate. But the point is, rather than feel these fulfill these urges and be burning in passion and going around laying and sleeping with any and everybody, he's saying in order to cut this, get married. That's really what he's saying. In order to avoid fornication. Now, I think it's important that we look at the state of who and what these people were actually in. He was speaking to Corinthians. He was speaking to Romans. He was speaking to heathens, okay? So when you're coming into a whole nation or a whole whole um, um, assembly of people who are heathens who don't know anything about how they should really be conducting themselves, it's almost like you're, you're coming into a place where a bunch of pigs are full of mud and they're all dirty. 
and you got to get in there and say, okay, I got to wash you off and get you clean, and then I'll wash you off and get you clean, and then you two will become a couple. You get married, and you go and stop this. And these people were in a state of debauchery, just like we are in a state of debauchery right now. So we're expecting for these Torah laws to actually for us to be able to apply all of these Torah laws when we're already in a state of debauchery. The the book of Isaiah said, and in that land, the land shall be married. So what do you do when you have 45 million Rahabs and 45 million, you know, Baals? And somebody is coming in here to say you all are in a state of darkness. Yes. You've been married, you've been divorced, you've been married, you had children out of wedlock, um, this guy has babies everywhere, this woman has probably been married two or three times, this person has been a prostitute, this person has been a harlot. Do you look at them and say, oh, according to the Torah, uh, since you got babies out of wedlock, you can't get married. And brother, since you got, you can't get married. No, we're all in a state of debauchery. So it's a matter of you pulling these people up out of the, the miry clay and cleaning them off and putting them together in order to stop the debauchery. Because if you leave these men and women unmarried, the same thing is just going to keep turning over, the burning, the passion, the lust. It's going to keep turning and turning and turning, and you're not going to ever bring a nation out of a state of this. So I believe that at this time, this is what Paul was doing. He was coming into a place where the whole place had been given over to heathenism, idolatry, sexual lust, and perversion, and now he's got to clean them up and show them how they are to walk. And that's the way we have to see our people. Because I'm getting a lot of people calling me saying, well, sis, I'm just coming into this truth. You know, and I, I've been married before, and I have two children, but the brothers are telling me now I can't get married no more. But then here's another brother who's, or, or, or a sister who's been in the same situation. They say, well, I'm, I'm, you know, this is my second wife, and we just came into the truth. Are you going to tell them to divorce? Because he done broke the law too. So, see, we all are in a cursed state. We're all in a filthy rag state. But somebody's got to come along and start pairing this thing off to, to set it back in order. That's, that's what I'm finding. I, I gotta, yeah, I apologize. Sorry for the interruption, but that's powerful information right there you put out there. And uh, everybody else, uh, I just want to let y'all know that uh, Brother Kevin is on the phone lines right now. Say hello to uh, Brother Kevin. Hey, what's good, everybody? How y'all doing? How y'all doing, brother? All right. All right. Yeah, man, it's his first time as well on the panel. Uh, so you heard some things. I know you stood by and heard some uh, <laughs> some of the information being presented. And uh, the topic yeah. is, is it better to marry than to burn? Uh, what do you want to add? Go ahead. Um, basically everything that the sisters just said, um, I will advise everybody to just read, uh, first Corinthians chapter six and seven and everything that she has laid out was exactly that. Uh, if you begin in chapter six, Paul starts off with these words, dare any of you having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. So basically what he's about to put there, he's about to put their foot in a behind and basically say, how can you? Uh, to summarize six, uh, can go among one another and say that one has defrauded you or another has done this and go to the law and this, that, and the other when you yourself have done wrong. Um, everybody knows that, that famous uh, 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 quote from verse 9. He says, though ye not that the, unright the unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. He said, as were some of you. So he was telling these people, look, you cannot go. We're all broken. And when Christ came, basically what he has done, he hasn't done away with the law, but what he has done is put it on a higher plane. He now tells us, if you even lust with the woman within your heart, you have committed adultery. Or... If, in, on the same uh, note, he said, uh, you know, if you hate your brother, you have committed murder. So we have to understand that there is a, there is a brokenness in a, in a condition that is going on with us that we must now render ourselves uh, uh, responsible, uh, not only to God, who is first and foremost, but also to ourselves and to society. Uh, going back to what the brother said, that's the whole uh, uh, purpose for marriage. The purpose for marriage is really this, is to make a declaration not before, only before God, but for, to the society to let people know that this is your stance, this is who you are with, 
and this is your responsibility as far as those children that are risen under your name, under your household, and this, that, and the other. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, lust and burning, what Paul is basically getting at is if you feel, basically, if you feel that you yourself cannot get into, cannot go into an area uh, where, uh, one moment. My apologies for that, man. I got kids and whatnot. So I'm taking up for my responsibilities in the household, you know. <laughs> but uh, basically, um, he's basically saying is this in summary. I can go ahead and read it. It's uh, If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and uh, you go to verse 6. Now, actually, we can start at, uh, yeah, we can go to verse uh, 6. And I want people to listen to this carefully. Uh, notice Paul is offering this as a suggestion. He is not saying that this is a commandment. But rather, he's only offering this option to those who have the, the, the will and the mindset and the power to control themselves and render themselves to God according to what gift that they have. He starts off by saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6, he says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So notice he says that. So it's not a commandment for you to stay single, but he's saying to those who are will. It goes on, verse 7. For I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after his this manner and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them that they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So basically what you're dealing with is why put yourself in the position where you're trying to seek the face of the Most High and obey his law, statutes, and commandments, and at the other hand, on the other hand, contend with yourself and fight with yourself. That's basically a mind divided, that's a tongue divided, and that's somebody that's double-minded. We already know what Christ thinks of those who are double-minded. He also says that those who are lukewarm, he'll, he'll spew them out their mouth because you are either one way or the other, and you keep wavering like a, like a ship's rudder. So basically what he's saying is it is better for you not to contend with yourself and go through that if you can't focus on the most high. Because it's kind of like this. What's the point? If you're staying single and you're, st- and you're keeping yourself, to render yourself to the most high, yet you're contending with yourself and your lust and everything else that you're thinking of, then how are you fully giving yourself to the most high? He's basically saying, look, get yourself together. Either marry. If you think you can do this, then do it. But if you cannot, do not attempt to do so. Because all you're going to do is battle with yourself and your lust for women, or if it's the opposite sex, the women, their lust for men, if it grows too strong, it has the power to interfere greatly with that which you are dealing with with the Most High. Now, this, notice what he says to the Mary. He says in verse 10, and unto the Mary, I command you. He's no longer giving a suggestion. He's saying, look, you're married now. This is the command. But, but not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but if she departs, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And it goes on to say, and let the husband put away his, not, not put away his wife, but to the rest I speak not, not, not I, but the Lord. But if thy brother have a wife and believe it not, and she be pleased to dwell with them, let them not, not put her away. So basically, as he gets on to the rest of that saying, is that when you are married, you already made a declaration to the Most High that you enter society to take care of this wife and anything that comes from under that umbrella, be it kids or anything else. That's where your responsibility lies. And if you find yourself in a position where you, quote, unquote, will burn or pretty much the lust or to feel like you have to get with a woman or this, that, and the other, then you have a place to go, a place that is sanctified by the Most High so you can relieve that stress and that pressure without any of the world getting on you. I think it is a blessing to have a wife, personally, because when I do feel that way and I put myself away from those high, when that feeling comes about, the devil can't get me. He can't come in my face and lie to me and say, oh, you need to go out and satisfy that lust. Yeah, I can do it in covenant. I can do it with my wife, whom I have made a direct declaration to in society, and whom I can do this freely without worrying about the guilt of sin. I can do that. So that's the beauty of marriage. But if I had the power... And I know I don't, <laughs> but if I had the power that I could stay single and I could give myself 100% to the most high and not have to deal with those effects and that, and that, and that feeling, 
then I can do it 100%. And that's why Paul said he made it as a suggestion that you can do that. But if you cannot, it's best to marry so that if you do have to do that, you're doing it within law and covenant and truth. And that's all I got to say on that. Can, can I come in on that? Yeah. What's that? I wanted to say, yeah, I want to come in on that. That was, that was uh, 100% accurate. But uh, the reason why I, I really highlight the seriousness of marriage and the life or death commitment because when I came up, a lot of cats, like they have a video on YouTube where uh, the group GMS, they advise the young men to go get whores. Like if you get, and that's why a lot of Israelite men really d- dismiss the covenant of marriage. Like there's no putting nobody away no more. Okay, the son of man came and reiterated what was from the beginning. That's why I'm really hard on that. And um, I've been deceived with that too. Like they didn't, they didn't show the severeness of doing that, taking a wife and then putting her away because you don't like her no more or you want to go and get another woman because you have more uh, lust in you and all that. Because a lot of people are confusing uh, fornication with having multiple wives. I've seen this. I've seen men make this mistake. And we need to implement that uh, more, how serious and how severe marriage is. And you're just not going to be putting a woman away and just get your rocks off and all that, okay? Because people don't, they're not, they don't see how serious, and you're going to burn for that. Christ is bringing judgment for that. That's why now we have to come out of that mindset and get back into those customs and really take marriage deadly, sincerely, take it as, 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 as serious as possible because he's going to be judging people on that, okay? Like you said, we all come in from gross darkness. That's why I read that in the beginning. But now that you're in this truth and this true understanding, there's no more doing that that wickedness that we done, we have done before we came in that. And we have to make that mandatory. But that's it. Okay. Um, I, I, you said something about it was inaccurate. Uh, I think we, we pretty much agree that uh, marriage must be taken seriously. But uh, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're speaking about the context of those who are not married and what does it mean to burn, correct? Say that again. Right. So in, 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 that, in that sense, uh, I understand what you mean and where you're coming from in regards to marriage. What is your opinion to those who, uh, who, who seek not to be married, yet it's the face of the Most High? There it is right here. Uh, this is Matthew 19. And this is why Paul brought up Corinthians 7 chapter, because he was taught by the Son of Man. This is Matthew 19, starting at 10. It says, His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. That's the same thing Paul said in the first verse of 1 Corinthians 7. Look what the Son of Man said. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive the same, so they to whom it is given. Then it says, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. That's one type of eunuch, okay? Then it says, And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs, of men, men were castrated in ancient times. Then it says, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. And the reason why Christ brought this up because of this. This is Matthew 19. Look what he said. This is Matthew 19, verse 28. 28. It says, and Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, okay, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Then it says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or wife. So there's people that's going to do that in the name of being in this gospel and getting in that kingdom of heaven, because it's so thin to get in that kingdom because there's so much immorality going around. There's women that lie. They haven't had millions of men. So if you're in this gospel or you come to do this truth, it's hard for you to choose a wife because there's barely no virgins left. So that's why it was so complicated. But that's what it is. It says, and if everyone that have forsaken houses or brother or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. So if it comes to that where you may be in a situation, what if you, I'm going to give you an example. What if you come in this truth 
And a week ago, you just slept with a man's wife, committed adultery. Are you the keeper? Yeah, hold on. Let's get some of our ladies involved. Oh, Mona, you can, uh, yeah, yeah, let's yeah, get man. some of the ladies involved. Forget it, Mona. Okay. Um, before I, I touch on what, what Brother Aswad just said, because it's, it's rolling around in my head as it relates to this scripture that is being reviewed, I think a lot have been said, um, and it begs to ask the question as we're examining, is it better to marry, and I've heard this before, to do the work of the Most High, when one of the very first commandments is be fruitful and multiply. So what comes to my mind is why is, in this sense, marriage is looked at as a consolation. It's looked at as secondary when it is the responsibility of us to be fruitful and multiply and bring up righteous children. So for me, in this text of what Paul is saying and what people um, often are trying to say is that it's kind of like what the Catholic Church says, and I, I mean, people might not agree, but, you know, it's higher, you know, to be a nun and, and a priest, you know, and be celibate. than and, and, you know, if you're lowly and you really can't rock with that, then go ahead and get married. Is this the right. doctrine that the, the Catholic Church is propagating? Should we be subscribing to this doctrine when in the book of Malachi the Creator says, listen, is it not for you, to, um, you two to become one and bring forth righteous seed? So why are we looking at or why is it that we're uh, buying into a narrative that looks at marriage in such a state as like what Brother Aswar is saying, it's a serious thing. And it's something that the Creator has given us. That's my first question. The second one is when you go into marriage because you're burning, then what kind of children are you going to procreate? <laughs> mm. You know, we're also looking at um, a debased uh, understanding of what it means to procreate. We procreate that which we are. So if we're on a lower vibration and you just burning every minute, then you're gonna you're gonna procreate lower vibrational beings. You understand? And so when we look at our foreparents, oftentimes they were barren. Oftentimes they went with a pre-meditated thought that they wanted to procreate a child of the covenant. And then you have you have people like Yitzchak and Yaakov. You know, you have these. You have Samuel, who his mother knew. I wasn't burning when I went to go make Samuel. You understand what I'm saying? I wanted to procreate a servant onto the most high. So my question is, is, are we even approaching the marriage thought in a way that is giving us what we're getting? And and um, well, I'm sorry if I, if I went off track, but that's what's coming to my mind as I'm listening to the whole conversation, that if you read it for what it says on face value, like he says, you know, to marry is good, but to be like me is better. Like, what does that mean? Okay. You know what I mean? What does that mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so, hey, so in regards, yeah, go ahead. Sister, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, can, is it for me now? Yeah, okay, yeah? Sister Maya. We're going to come back to you, Brother Kevin. We're going to come back to you. Sister Maya, okay. and then, and then we'll come back. Um, I'm not gonna. You know, I, was, I just kind of want to stick to the first Corinthians seven, and I think that our sister brought up a really good question, and I think that that's what. Um, forgive me because I'm going. I haven't slept in three days, so if I seem less on point than usual, I apologize for that. Um, the question she asked is: So why is this question of celibacy um, being addressed in this in this letter? I said earlier when I my, my opening statement that the letter is the second or third or whatever letter to the Corinthians because now they're asking very specific questions. And the question of why, why is this question of celibacy something that is on their mind? When we see um, it opens up, Paul starts off with uh, do not touch a woman, that he thinks it's better not to touch a woman. This is something that's happening. This is part of the first, uh, this early church's reality. That three of the most major Prominent um, leaders of this of this of this um, particular line of thought are all at the time of their ministry, at the time that they're engaging the public, not married. John has what we know about um, John is that we don't have a lot of information about his married life. Um, Hamashiach is infamously not married. Paul, at the, at the stage of this ministry, also not married. So the question of okay, so. Um, all the people that we look up to, none of you guys are married. So should we be, is being married a good thing or a bad thing? Understand also contextually, at this period of time, the Julian laws are, have been put in effect that penalize celibacy. There are actual penalties for people not remarrying. But the first 
So the first century church is looking at, okay, well, these are the people we want to emulate, but this is the law. So they have a legitimate question. How do we navigate this? If we emulate you and we exclude from, um, from sex, even even in these earliest, it's like because um, in, in verse 3, he's not talking about people who are unmarried. He's talking about the behavior of married couples who have decided to abstain from laying with each other because it, it's being – it seems to have been put forward or emphasized to them that there is something more righteous about abstaining than engaging because all of their role models are abstaining. We see that with Moses, and these are the examples of that because they have the Torah. The Torah is always translated for them. They see that Moses, where he was about to receive um, the, the promise at, the, at the, in Mount Sinai, Everybody has to abstain from sex. So they look at there's something good about abstaining from sex. We see that um, when David goes um, to deal with the shoe bag, he says, oh, none of us have had any, any saying with the women. So, I mean, these are the things that are being circulated in their time. So, okay, so, do, so there's something, it looks like there's something glorious about not sleeping with each other. So he's saying, listen, don't do that. Paul said, listen, if you're married, don't do that. Don't, don't defraud each other. It, it, you know, unless it be for fasting and prayer, and even then, only for an agreed time because temptation, you cannot get, you don't want Satan to come in your marriage and start to tempt you. So they have, they're, they're under, um, they're under the, the questions are all with merit because there's a real conflicting kind of ideology happening within what they see and what they, what they know their civil laws are, what these new spiritual laws look like, and they're really trying to understand what do we do. Because, again, like I said, in this period of time, the Julian laws will say things like um, the unmarried woman, or if you're unmarried or a widow, and you will refuse to get remarried, you, you don't have the right to collect your inheritance. You can be barred from um, obtaining an inheritance. That's on their laws, in their law. Um, so this is not something that is, is um, happening out of, you know, in a vacuum. This is happening for a lot of reasons, a lot of factors at play. Um, so he even says that he wishes that everyone was like him. And what's interesting about that is that he, he is, I'm, listen, not right now, just, oh, I'm sorry, that's my nephew. Um, at this point in his ministry, he is not married. There's there's ample inter- in, in internal evidence to suggest that he may have been at some point, but at this point he isn't married, and so he's dealing with that. And I'm I'm just saying that to say this: that yes, you know the the overarching principles of our Hebraic culture that have to do with placing an emphasis on marriage and and that is important. I think that everyone's going to agree that it's an important covenant that is something that is expected. The original intention. Even in the original couples, couples don't get married with the intention of divorcing. It's never the first intention. But that's, I think that there is merit in dealing with why these questions are coming up now, especially when we know that it is, a, it is, um, it is commanded of us to be fruitful and multiply, and yet these first churches are having this kind of internal struggle. They're wondering about being celibate. Married couples are practicing celibacy. Why would they do that? Why are married couples even considering, in the context of marriage, abstaining from one another? Because there are all these other things at play, and I think that we need to pay attention to those contextual issues. And uh, although I, I don't, I'm not trying to discredit going into all the historical precedences of all the ways that we have done things in the past, but. This is a very specific thing. He, he is talking about immorality, but he's talking about celibacy versus being married for a very particular, very important, very pressing, in that t- very contemporary reason. There are laws, both civil and, and Torah, that they are, they're contesting, that they're fighting with and trying to, to struggle to understand. And that's what's going on in the second or third letter that they're writing to Paul to get understanding because how, on the one hand, are we supposed to understand the sanctity of marriage and none of you are married? What are we supposed to understand about having sex with our spouses? None of you are having sex with anybody's spouses. Celibacy is supposed to be a good thing. What are we supposed to do? And even those of us who are choosing to be celibate are being penalized on the civil side. 
So what do we do? They're going to talk because they want to know what to do in a very real, very pressing, very physical, not metaphysical, but very present, pressing, very basic level. All right. Okay. Okay, Sister Eunice, are you there? Do you have something to say on that? Yes, I'm here. Um, basically, I just look at it like this. You know, I'm 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 real simplistic about things. Um, when it comes to Jeremiah, when it comes to John, when it comes to Paul, there are some men that were made eunuchs for the Most High. Okay, and then there were some that were self-made eunuchs. You know, there are some that that the Most High literally said, "I am setting you aside just for me, in me only." And and so we we found within Jeremiah, I believe he desired a wife, but you know, no, it wasn't for him. The Most High was like he was for him, and the same with John. There are people that are strategically placed like that, and who are we to question who the Most High decides to use strictly for him? And then there are some that are self-made units who decide within themselves that they want to dedicate themselves 100% to the most high and they don't have any sexual desires for, for, for marriage or, you know, you know, or for sex or whatever. But the overall principle is marriage is honorable. That's, that's the overall principle. And so as a nation of people, he said, one shall become a thousand, a thousand shall become a strong nation. We know that marriage is to, to procreation, to be fruitful and to multiply and to raise a seed up unto the most high. And so with that being said, for all those that are not able to contain their sexual desires, they first must go to the most high and ask him spiritually, who have you chosen for me on this earth to be my mate? Because it is a spiritual contract that has to be made first with the most high. And just like he chose a wife for Isaac when he had his servant to go out and, and look for his wife. And he brought, um, was it uh, Rachel back? And, and um, or is it Rebecca? I'm not sure. I always get the two R's mixed up. But he said, whoever's bearing, she's going to be bearing a pitcher of water. And that's the one that I've chosen for Isaac to be his wife. So that's the mentality that we as a people or a nation of Israel have to get back to. Rather than sit here and keep giving into these sexual desires and committing fornication, it's as simple as that. Now, one has to decide: Am I fine? Am I okay without being married? Can I truly connect myself with the Most High and be spiritually fine without any sexual desires and make myself a self-made unit? Or can I not do this, and do I need to go ahead and seek the most high in finding me a spouse and being married in order to avoid fornication? It's, it's as simple as that. Right. Right, it is. It is. It's just as simple as that. Um, I don't know who else is going to speak next, but um, basically... I want to come in after you. Yeah, 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 no problem, brother. Um, basically, I, I would like to agree with all the sisters that just spoke. Um, basically, you guys each talked about it in your own way, but at the same time, you guys confirm all of the many truths in this. Like um, th- some of the questions that were raised, though, was uh, the Catholic Church, they do this thing. They follow this. Uh, should we follow the nurse footsteps? Uh, I would say no. Uh, just because a, a group or some type of organization has an aspect of the truth or they borrow something or they look at something and start to follow it, doesn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, we're following the Catholic Church or doing what they're doing. Rather, I think that in understanding, we should grasp why there was this attention towards celibacy, why this attention towards not marrying and being unto yourself and being for the most high. Um, I think for thousands of years prior to when the Gospels came on the scene, uh, mankind has already established uh, the importance of rearing up sons or having family or building up nations. So if you look at the context of what the Gospels were truly about, it is about bringing up the kingdom of God, because that's what the gospels actually mean. Uh, when it says Christ went out and preached the gospel, or he went and preached the kingdom of God. Uh, we read in uh, uh, John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, But as many are received of him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And Christ even said that I can make children from these stones. Or again, he says that the Father seeks true worshipers who worship in the spirit and the truth. So, it's not that that was put away with. Again, Christ came and said, I have not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. So now the context is just changing. We're looking, the, the Gospels is meant to give us a spiritual insight as to now we're not focusing on the flesh. 
because in verse 13 in John, he says, which were born of, of the blood, not which were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So now we say, aha, the perspective of the Gospels is not to say forsake everything that God has put forth and that is not good anymore, but rather focus on the spiritual aspect of it, but rather focus on those who seek, the, uh, he speaks, uh, seeks worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. So that's what the whole th- thing of the Gospels is about. Now, like the sisters just said that spoke uh, in, uh, last, uh, she said a very good thing. It's only to those who have a, uh, 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 the power to do that. Uh, as I read out of 1 Corinthians, he says, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So we shouldn't think that it is a commandment or something that we should do to forsake family or not get married, only within the, our means or within uh, what we're able of do, or capable of doing. Uh, if I only got $2 in the bank, I'm not going to try to buy a house. Like, I'm just not going to do it because it's not within my means. Uh, so basically, this is something that's only to yourself because you would be a powerful asset. I believe that in my own experience, you would be someone who would be uh, more profitable as far as uh, rent, um, um, turning those to Christ because 100% of your time is going towards that. You don't have that desire and you're fighting it and you're giving yourself to the most high. Now, uh, concerning those who are married, um, I really don't see anything in the gospel that really says to to forsake them in that sense. Um, because the second question the sister asked was, if we do have somebody who does link up or get married for their lust, then we shouldn't pay attention to that anyway, because the man was driven by his lust to do such a thing. But if a man marries a woman, and the communion between him and the woman is in God, and he's seeking Christ with all his heart, mind, and soul, or God with all his heart, mind, and soul, then the lesson that I will learn if that was my father was that, one number one, I see a dynamic in which the man is sustaining himself within that which is a covenant instead of going out and doing lawlessness. Um, that would be one thing that I will learn. Another thing is that if my father, who is seeking the most high with all his heart, mind, and soul, because remember the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. So to say that the children will not be profitable in such a relationship is to say that the word of God will be no effect. Because if we truly have belief and faith in the scriptures, then we understand that if we do seek the most high along with our spouse, our spouse understanding what we are doing on this earth and us coming together within the covenant to fulfill one another's needs, I think that the children could benefit that from that greatly. Um, we already seen the result of those who have been in single parent homes. I Me, mean, I was I was raised by my mother up until the point my dad came back into my life and decided to marry my mother and then that's when things got it better. Uh, so I've seen firsthand not having that uh, model in my home and then having that model in my home and then again not having that model in my home. And then now it gave me, I can make a distinction now in my marriage, what to do, what not to do, how to approach the most high, how to seek his face, how to come to my wife, how to have a relationship with her. Life taught me that, and this has taught me that along with the word. So it's been threefold. So um I really do think that we could, in closing, I really do think we could learn from that type of relationship. I don't think we're copying the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Catholic Church. And, again, as the last sister said, um, the one thing people should keep in mind is only for those who can do it and, have, and can do it within their means rather than choosing to do that, knowing that you can't get away with it, and then you basically burn it. So, so go ahead, brother. Yeah, uh, yeah I want to wanna say this too, right? Um, the, disciples, the apostles... Uh, weren't just regular men. They they had the Holy Spirit, so they spoke for the future as well, not just during that time period. And I'll give an example of what I mean. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 7. It says, Are thou bound unto a wife? Verse 27. Are thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Are thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. Right? But And if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But look what Paul said. But this I say, brethren, that the time is short, okay? This is a major factor that we need to examine. Paul back then was telling them that the time is short. So in this time period, it's shorter, way shorter than what Paul was talking about. And I'm going to show what Paul was talking about. It says, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they had none, right? 
And they that weep as though they weep not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. Now, why did Paul bring this up? This is in the Apocrypha, 2nd Ezra 16, verse 18. He says, the beginning of sorrow and great mourning. That's what's headed for this earth. You see the condition of the earth right now? All kind of chaos is going on. Food shortages. He was preparing the people back then for this time we're living in now. The Son of Man spoke about it in Matthew, the 24th chapter. So if you're married or you're, 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 you're really bonded to a big family, it's just going to be a harder struggle for you because you have to feed those children. There's, a, there's going to be a food shortage. There's going, to, there's going to be famine. So you got to really evaluate, you know, is this the time really to get a big family and settle down? Or are we in the time of, like, almost like during the time of Moses? where it's, we're going to be delivered and everything is going to be on a scarce basis. you got to examine that. Like, the way things are going in this world today, is it profitable for me to have a big family? you got to look at that, too. you got to look at it at all angles. And it's coming. Terrible days is coming for this world. It's obvious. you got to be blind not to see the prophecies coming to pass. So we got to take that into account as well when we get a spouse. You know, that's all I'm saying. Brother Sal? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you can continue uh, to yeah, do your thing. Go ahead. I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm just doing some okay. things on social media right now. But go ahead. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay, no problems. If, if anybody's out there who would like to chime into the conversation, feel free to do so. Um, uh, Muna, I wanted to say something, too, when you were saying about um, people seeking wives, you know, while burning in a, in a lustful state. But we, we do have to go back to the scripture that I believe the brother read earlier. It says, if a man entice a maid, meaning if he seduce a maid or a virgin that is um, – that he is that is not engaged to or to be married or that's not betrothed. It says and has sexual intercourse with her, he must pay the bride price and she is to become his wife. So that lets you know that the most high already knew that we were going to be working on a lesser <laughs> vibration as far as passion, lust and desire go because the word was entice or seduce. But still yet he didn't let him escape it. It's like she's gonna be your wife. You've got to marry her, pay the bride price and marry her, you know, so it, it, he knew we were going to be operating on that level, but that right. still didn't, you know, it, that still didn't give us the, the, the right to say, hey, you're not going to get married. They have to still get married. And because this, the, the person actually go ahead and I believe consent to this and, and do the right thing after they, you know, have sex with this person, I believe that's the most high allowing them to redeem the act to redeem that sin, and then they can be able to raise up children unto him. Because let's face it, a, a lot of us didn't get healed, right? <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm, but there are still people that have been married for 40 or 50 years, you know, and they may have laid with each other before, you know, but your parents are still married and together and have raised up children, you know, and, and so it's there's no escaping it. He's like, you're going to get married, and that's order, and that's to keep, you know, whoredom and fornication, you know, out of the land, from it polluting our people in our land. All right. I want to thank you for that. That was the voice of Sister Eunice. This is the conversation we're having today. Is it better to marry than to burn? And really looking at this as it is written, the context of which has been written, is it applicable today? Is this the reason why you should go into a marriage? Um, is this what elders or teachers or mores should advise you um, you know, go ahead and get married because you're burning. You understand? This is the stuff that is being said, and the marriage, as we have already outlined, more often than not, constitutes just laying with the individual, which will equal upon the case. So um, it becomes a sticky situation all around, and we're just having this conversation. So if you have any questions or comments that you would like to share, feel free to uh, call in. The number is 646-716-7320. 646-716-7320, and you can press 1. Um, uh, there so we as go, this, there we go. I like, I like, I like that, Amuna, there we go. <laughs> like that's yeah, our, the whole phone right there. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, we this, do have some callers actually in the phone lines right now. So let's right. go to the people out there, and let's see what they got to say. Again, you know that number. Let's go to the first, first person, uh, 773-640. You live in the air. 
brother. It's Shalom, bro. Uh, I like to say first off, this is a beautiful, beautiful conversation. This is a holy, this is a holy conversation. Um, the sisters, I make it. I grace and peace to all the sisters. Um, I like to say uh, uh, also grace and peace. Shalom to my brother Yahweh Abban Yasharel. Shalom Barakadah to my brother uh, Awa. This is Mikael, man. Hey, bro, how you doing? Man, I'm good. Bro. I'm good, beloved. I'm good, man. But, um, this is a real nice conversation because what I hear, I don't hear a debate. I hear y'all sharpening iron with these sisters. And actually, everything that they saying is going according to the scriptures, and everything y'all saying is going to according to the scriptures. So it's not even a dispute. It's putting this puzzle together. And right. it was one thing one of the sisters brought up earlier in a war. You, a war brought up the, the point of the burning in a, a, a I don't know if I caught it in the end, but I assume you were talking about the uh, eternal damnation or burning in a lake of fire. And um, the sister brought up the burning in the flesh. And actually looking at the scriptures, I will presume that you both correct. And because mm-hmm. it can be both. For the simple fact, we know that one of the penalties that would get you to eternal damnation is adultery. The most mm-hmm. I don't play about adultery. He mad at Israel for committing spiritual adultery. So everything he does and sets up for us on the land, as Israel was supposed to be an example to the nation uh, of him, we're supposed to reflect the most high as a nation. So the things he tells us to do in our house reflect the things in heaven. And when the sister was talking about the burn of the flesh, we know that that's also true. And we can go straight to the book. The same, same brother Paul actually makes that clear. And Romans chapter 1, I'm going to read Romans chapter uh, 1, and I'm going to pick it up at uh, verse 26. It says, for this cause, God gave them up into vile affections, so for even their women mm-hmm. did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward mm-hmm. another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. And you know that recompense is diseases and bastardized children, and I mean diseases and all types of stuff. So when you look at that, neither one of y'all were incorrect. Y'all were both correct. It's just being put together. Now, another point I think the listeners should know is that this is all a reflection of the Most High. If you look in the scriptures, um, I know even in one scripture, it tells you about when he took us out of Egypt, um, he had made a, a, a reference to he didn't want us to defile his name amongst the heathen. Meaning, we know that even the nation of Israel, or have you said, Yashorel Israel, is a representation, representation of the characteristic of his name, Prince with Power of God and Men. So whatever we do, we are his namesake. We are reflecting our father's house, which is our spiritual father. So he didn't even want us to do folly amongst the nations because it makes him look bad. And if y'all don't believe me, we could we could go to like uh, uh like Leviticus, Leviticus chapter nineteen, and see like the thing with Paul, like y'all was saying, a lot of people if they don't understand the Torah, good or the Tanakh, Paul can get them in some trouble if they not well, and, and it ain't Paul's intention. It's just, you know, Peter warned you about this. You got to be sharp dealing with Paul's right. And um, if you look in uh, Leviticus chapter 19, it says, um, let's just look at how he tell the house, how to deal with the household of your fleshly father, because it's a reflection of your husband's father. It says, um, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 29, it says, do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. So we know that even that your household, if your dad, if your daughter is out there considered to be a whore, or you can prostitute her to get some money or whatever, that whole not only is your house going to bear that name forever, but that influence that that woman may have by not being dealt with it's going to spread throughout the land. So all you're going to do is produce more little whore. And we see that today in our society. Our men have failed so far from the glory. Oh, he talk about us, too, because I just want to say the whoremonging is just as mad as the whoredom. 
they both in the same category because you can't hire one without the other. And, again, you can scoot straight over to Leviticus uh, chapter uh, 21. Scoot over to them, uh, Leviticus chapter 21. And, again, it say in, in verse 9, and this is going back to the marriage. And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the horse, she profaneth her father. She shall be burnt with fire. Now, the reason I read that is because that's dealing with the, lead, the, the high priest in particular. And we know Israel represented the Holy Father, the Heavenly Father. Then the high priest was even so much more that they had to be holy that it was so serious. If one of his daughters was out there doing that stuff, you know, she she ain't just get, you know, the regular demo. She got burnt, set on fire. So all of this is on a spiritual level, and and it's a real seriousness to it. And I got a, just another spot to go to. Um, matter of fact. You could just say it real close, and um, y'all go to it, y'all, because y'all know what it said. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 17, where he say, we will not have a whore uh, of the daughters of Israel, and we should not have a sodomite of the sons of Israel. And it's two things the most high talk a whole lot about that he care about. It's the seed, the seed of a man, because not only do he want to, he wanted to prolong the bloodlines, which, which we were supposed to be a holy nation, we know that, but also the purity of our women is extremely important to him. And I think like y'all brought y'all uh, brought up earlier, if you look at the time of the New Testament, a lot of people have been corrupted. And one made a good point when he read that, um, that precept where it was basically where he was saying that, you know, it was brothers that was, it was sisters that was lying, saying they was virgins and they wasn't even though they had little ways to tell, you know, with the hymie cloth, they sit it under the female for chariot and bus. You know, they could accuse you of not being a, a virgin or whatever. But, it, you know, it's people coming up with tricky lies. It also go back to the man where uh, Moses wrote the, the record of divorce, but it wasn't supposed to be from the beginning. And why did he say he did it? Because the hardening of men's heart. So that means brothers was putting sisters away for petty stuff, not adultery, probably because her breath stank, her feet was tore up, she couldn't cook. You know how Israel is, right? You know what I'm saying? It's just, just throwing sisters away for straight foolishness. So it's all it all got to do with when could you ever trust Israel to do what's right? You can't. And every time he laid something down, we found the way to pollute it so they had, you know, like, Throw another little, I wouldn't say that he changed it, but they threw another little level to it to stop us from destroying ourselves with our foolishness. And uh, one more spot I'd like to go to, and I think this really top it off good, is uh, First Timothy. And this is why I'm, I'm, I'm really bringing this up is because the number one key is to be a holy people that take us right back to the Torah. His whole reason for everything was for us to be um, holy. Yeah, and in First First Timothy chapter three, right? We're gonna deal with a, a position because it was something the sister brought up about the Catholic Church, and she's absolutely correct. But the thing is, we know that the the Catholic Church, the Mother Church, as they call themselves, you know what I'm saying? She mimics everything that the Israelites did, and she polluted. That's what she do. She's polluted everything, everywhere from the priestly garments to everything. She bite off Israel and she polluted it and spit it back out to the world. So if you look at First Timothy chapter three, verse one and two, keep this real close. It say, uh, "This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of bishop, now this is a, a high rank in the church, getting back to being holy again." He desires a good work. Now go back to what y'all was saying about the works. If somebody just decide to make themselves a unit, trying their best to keep themselves pure, just look at this, verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality after teach and after teach. Now, what's key is the uh, credentials that he named. It's said to be blameless first. So that means you don't you should you shouldn't have yourself in a position where anybody could accuse you of anything. So if you out here and you got multiple wives or you ain't telling nobody and somebody say, Well, you know, I slept with him or whatever, you not taking care of these women, you can be brought up on charges, you know what I'm saying, uh, that fall back under the law. Then it say the husband of one wife. Not that it was saying that 
it wasn't Israelites with wives. The reason he brought up one wife is, for one, he's taking the office of bishop, which it already said is a good work. That is dang near a full-time job for the Most High. So how are you going to take care of two, three, four families and you got to do the work of the Lord? It also said, of course, it says vigilant, sober, of good behavior, and giving hospitality, and, of course, apt to teach. So um, everything y'all was saying is exactly on point. I'm loving this. But the number one thing is he's trying to reform us back to uh, a holy state, which we've we tinkered around with in our history, but we never uh, truly ever fulfilled that. And so with that, I'm just going to listen. I, I'll be on the line. I'll mute my microphone. Great lesson, man. Great. Thank you so much for that, brother. You brought up some very, very interesting points, and substantiated the points. So I hope for those who are listening, feel free to call in um, so that we can hear your thoughts. Brother Sal, is there anyone else who has pressed one at this time? Yeah, we have a few more people on the phone lines. Again, you know that number by now, 646-716-7320. Is it better to marry than to burn? Is it better to marry than to burn? And remember, we do, we're going to do this every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, different conversations pertaining to relationships. So uh, let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to uh, 312-871. You're live in air. Yes, how you doing? Shalom. Hey, shalom. Shalom. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello. Oh, hey, Shalom. How y'all doing? Uh, I'm Brother Eric from Chicago. And uh, I just want to say that I'm enjoying the uh, call. Uh, I really appreciate the honesty with, with you brothers and sisters. But, uh, like the brother just said, sometimes Israel, we try to find ways to do wrong because, you know, in Isaiah 5 it says uh, that um, the scripture where it says that uh we uh, we think evil is good and good is evil, so I'm really appreciating the honesty. And I just want to share uh, just this scripture from Rebecca, and that's it. Uh, it's Rebecca, uh, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. And uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. I just want to say I'm going to keep listening and shalom to everybody. Right, shalom. Appreciate the phone call. Huh. And, again, we have a lot of people on the phone lines listening to the show via phone or via Skype. If you're already listening on the phone, just press number one and we can add you in the conversation. However, if you're on social media, if you're on Blog Talk Radio, you've got to dial that number, 646-716-7320, and simply press number one and we'll add you in the conversation. Let's go back to the ladies on the panel, though. Let's go to uh, Mason. Mason, you there? That. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, did you want to address as far as that? Oh, matter of fact, I got a question actually in the chat room. Um, let me see what this question is. It says, um, what about the women out there that don't want to marry? Let's talk about the ladies out there that do not want to marry. All right. <laughs> Let's go to uh, any of you ladies want to t- uh, talk about that. There's ladies out there that don't want to marry, uh, they're saying. Uh, Let's go to Mason, I guess. Mason, got. Okay. Um. I often address this issue this way, and and it may it, it, to me it it goes back to a, a scripture in Revelation. It says, "Woe unto the inhabitants of that great city Babylon, because it has become the habitations of devils." So, with that being said, we're in Babylon. That means nine times out of ten, what you grab is essentially going to be a devil. And so because of that, we have to pray to the Most High. If we decide to get there, we have to pray and seek him on a spiritual level. Because if you're in a place that's given over to homosexuality, fornication, adultery, murder, you know, idolatry, drunkenness, whoredom, then it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And and I, and not only do I have that, I have a lot of brothers that inbox me like, sis, I would love to get married. I would love to find me a, a, a daughter of Zion to marry. So we can't say that there's, you know, brothers that don't want to get married, but like you said, they're, they're sifting through a needle in a haystack as well as the sisters. So when, you, when, you, when you're coming and you're running over, over demon after demon after 
demon after demon, then, yes, you will get that mind frame. You know, hey, I'd just rather wait until we get to the new kingdom. I don't want to get married. But I will say this. The word says, in the land shall be married. So I tell them, don't give up on the, the concept of it. You just have to pray and fast and become more spiritual and ask the Most High, is there a soulmate that he has picked and chosen for you, you know, rather than you just shut the door completely on it? But we we do have to be careful because there are some that have married and have literally brought demons in their house, literally demons, <laughs> conjuring in witchcraft and sorcery and all kind of things. And I've seen some good brothers and good sisters actually lose their mind because we don't want to be like Solomon when the Most High warns him about taking strange women up into his to marry because these people will literally get you off of the whole uh, the whole idea of considering even seeking after the Most High. If they will take you away from Him, and so we have to be careful with what we you know unite and call ourselves one with. And this is probably why you are finding a lot of women that don't want to get married, but then you will maybe find a son that just want to be the spirit of feminism that's resting on them. It's strictly the spirit of feminism, just being rebellious. I don't need a man except for one thing, and then, you know, once again, it goes back into fornication and whoredom. So we're not talking about those people. We're talking about the daughters of Zion who are just probably refraining because of what it is that you, you were picking and choosing. Our selection is very poor. I'm sorry, this place is given over to whoredom. We're in Sodom and Gomorrah, so... Hey, we just pray and ask the Most High to to find who it is that He's chosen for us to 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 marry. That's probably why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, Brother Kevin actually uh, was unable to stay on the phone lines, but we're gonna probably try to bring him back for the next uh, segment of the Relationship Challenge next week. So we appreciate the brother for coming on. But uh, let's go to Mayana. Uh, anything you want to add to that? Um, uh, actually, um, I think that everyone is making a lot of really good points in terms of the, the points that they want to make. And, um, and to, to answer the question that you posed to the panel, I think that some of the reasons why you have sisters that are refusing to marry for the reasons that the other sister gave it, and on, in some instances they really don't. They value being married at this time, particularly because there's so many conflicting doctrines. And those of us that are Hebrew, those women that are Hebrew and have accepted the truth, understand that the man that they are going to call their husband is going to be the man that they have to submit to and be vulnerable to and follow. And if from their perspective what they are experiencing are men that are double-minded and unstable, and then it's a fearful thing because of the fact that the brother Awar brought up earlier that this is a very important covenant that you enter into and it cannot be entered into lightly. So on the one hand, it does kind of look like they are just resisting these these important norms. Maybe, maybe, and I, I won't I won't say that it isn't true that some of them may be coming from uh, what's being called the feminist perspective of I don't need to be with a man for whatever those reasons are. But some of them could be coming from a very legitimate fear of, I don't want to be with the wrong man, because that's not something that you can give up lightly. Like, the fact, you know, whether uh, you accept the Torah principles of divorce or not, the fact is that the original intention is to, to get married and stay married as the objective. And once you get into that covenant, you cannot exit it lightly. So it doesn't make sense to go into it lightly. So there are some women that are hesitant. I have uh, spoken to quite a few women that have gone from being wildly optimistic about the men of Israel, and those same women are now completely discouraged and disenchanted with um, the men who are self-identifying as Israelites now. So I think that a lot of this kind of pushback is just kind of coming from the fact that we're so uh, we're so broken right now. And I think that when we start to be on the same page and, and start talking about the same things and having the same goals, then the women, the more women will feel, will have the confidence um, 
to get back into these unions. There's still a lot of really, really good brothers, and, and I, I try to let the sisters know that who talk to me. I happen to know quite a few really good, uh, well-grounded, well-rounded, highly informative men who are not out to, you know, to, to, to oppress you and, and wave the masculinity at you, but are earnestly trying to reconcile with the most high and want to find his his other half, you know, that's going to be meek for him the way the most high intended. So I, I, I kind of agree that there is a, a certain wave of resistance right now. I think on both ends, because we hear a lot of the men saying that the women are just at an unredeemable state. You know, there's a lot of very um, frustrated and frustrating conversations organized around how a lot of, some brothers feel like the women are just in such disrepair that they cannot be redeemed. So it's not something that's only coming from the side of the women. I think the brothers that are having that that feeling are also looking at their experiences and what they have seen, and they have lost a little bit of faith in us too. And so I think that uh, conversations like these and, and everybody being honest about what they understand and what they want to understand and what they're able to do and what they're not able to do uh, is going to go a long way towards healing, going towards resolving those issues. Mm. All right, war. what do you feel about that? some women out there that uh, that don't want to get married? Uh, what's your perspective on that? Right. Um, well, this is the option that we are offered by the Most High, okay? You marry or or be single or don't. That's the only option you're offered to be married. The opposite of being married is fornication, okay? So it's either you married or you're not dealing with nobody, you're celibate, as they say, or you're dealing with fornication. Those are the three dimensions, okay? So they got to make a choice. If you want to stay single now, if you mean you don't want to be married, meaning you want to sleep with a variety of men, then you won't catch that judgment. Most are cleaning all that up, man. All that up. He said his son. This, let me read this. This is a. This is a. Let me read this. This is a. First Thessalonians. Check check this out, right? And we're we're on the clock. The realness of this, we are all on the clock. Okay. It's either you come into this. This is this is how it is. It's either you come into this understanding that the Father's taking back His earth. <laughs> He's taking back His earth. All this foolishness and confusion is about to be done away with. And it's like the whole saying goes: you either uh, uh, roll with it, or it's gonna roll over you. And that's what our job is: to put this truth out to bring as much people as most our day that He wants to come in this. Because He's not playing now. You see the prophecies coming to pass. He's taking his earth back, and he's sending his son to do it. Let me read you. This is uh, first, Second Thessalonians uh, 1, verse 7. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. This is what the apostles said, right? When the Lord Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He's coming back with some mean, brute, terrible angels to put this earth back in order. And he's sent by the Most High. Then it says, in flame and fire, taking vengeance on them that know not the most high. So if you think you're going to live your life and don't care about these laws and statutes, you're on the hit list, okay? Then it says, and that will be not the gospel. And if you don't obey that gospel, because that gospel from the most high, it's bringing everything back to the first principle that the most high dropped, his will. Now, if you think you're going to be a, 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 a separate entity and you're going to live your life the way this world is, He's laying all this down. You see it. I mean, it's obvious. So that's why now this is time for us to come back to these statues, man. We're saying this, this is a terrible time we're in right now, and it's going to get a thousand times worse. That's all I'm saying. So if you want to, you know, like a lot of women, I don't need a man, and sleep with all this, have these uh, friends. I got a friend. <laughs> and, and all these different crazy acts, laying, women laying with women, men laying with men. The most I'm about to lay all that down. He's taking his effort back. And that's our job to get back in this. That's what the that's what the grace is about to get back into these statutes, laws, and commandments. And we're running out of time. It's getting closer and closer to this time period. He's coming back with these brute angels, and he's not playing. 
for old mean black man. <laughs> well, good. I ain't gonna call you. I got him. All right. Thank you so much, and thank everybody who just joined us. That was the voice of Brother Award Swordsman, okay. and we're having a conversation about. Is it better to marry or to burn? So if you just tuned in, you may be like, what in the world are they talking about? That's the topic of this show. Is it better to marry than to burn? My name is Amuna Yisrael, and I'm here with um, Brother Sal, Showtime. I'm the co-host. And so I have a question that I want to put on the table for those who are listening, as well as those who are on the panel. Um, So let's just bring it into today. You know, a sister or a brother, they come up to you. Um, You're in, you know, whether it be the Knesset, the camp, Facebook, whatever. And they say, and they express to you that they burn it, <laughs> and they have a desire, and they can't control it. What will you do? Will you advise them, as it says here in um, the book of First Corinthians seven? Would you give them the advice of Paul? What advice will you give them? And is there something? Is there an alternative or a practical way that they can um, begin to elevate from that state? So I'll start off with Sister Eunice. What would you tell them if they came up to you? Would would you give them this advice, or what advice would you give them? Is Sister Eunice still here? Yeah, I'm sorry. The question was, uh, in today's space and time, if somebody inboxed you, texted you, or came up to you and began to ask, and let you know that they're burning um, and they wanted advice what to do about these desires and this lust, what would you advise them in real time? Like for somebody who may be listening to this at some point and this is the issue that they're struggling with. I'm going to ask everybody that's the same question. What okay, well, I do, I do get that question a lot, actually. I do get that question a lot. Um, I get a lot of not only sisters and brothers asking me, you know, and I give them that actual scripture. Um, it's better to marry than to burn. So I tell them, if you feel that your sexual urges are going to be controlling you to the point that you can not stop lusting, or because you know, like you said, if a man looks upon a woman and he lusts within his heart, he's already committed adultery. So if you if you're becoming this this lustful creature and you feel that your sexual urges are overtaking you to the point where Nine times ten, you're going to act out on them, you know. And so, you know, I encourage them to cast down evil imaginations, you know, pray and fast and go to the Most High sincerely and seek him and ask him to bless you with a wife to bring you out of this state of, of, of lust and to bring you out of this state of burning and passion or feeling the, the urge to act out your urges. Because to be honest with you, there are some that are saying, hey, I'd rather masturbate and touch myself. So... <laughs> And that's a problem, too. You know, you're wasting your seed. You know, marriage is honorable. The bed is undefiled. Seek the most high on marriage. If you read those stories in in the Torah, there were men, you know, such as Isaac and and and. and and Jacob, they worked for they worked for their wife. They wanted a wife. Marriage was important, you know. And so the Most High knew this, and He sent them women that he knew that would be a good helpmate to them and that would be a good soulmate to them. And they were they were they were fine. So what's so wrong with us doing the same thing that our ancestors did? What's so wrong with going to the most high and allowing him to choose who we are to be with on this earth? So that's that's the answer that I get one. All right, so we got sister Eunice said she would bust out the first Corinthians on them. Uh, tell them it's better to marry than to burn. Our uh, sister Mal- Mayana, what would you tell them? Thank you for that, sis. What would you tell them, mm-hmm. sister Mayana? In these instances, um, often, because they are coming from this perspective and probably have already come into contact with the letters of Paul, they're probably expecting for me to give them that first twenty and seven um, advice. But instead, what I would point to them is that Paul does not encourage you to give into your passions and just call it marriage. You know, um in for example, when he's writing to second to Timothy in one of his second letters to Timothy, he says for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but have itching ears or accumulate for themselves. Teachers to seek their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth. So this idea that passion is something that can be resolved by marriage is is just kind of 
giving into the passion with the solution inside. He also writes when he's writing to the Galatians, he says, from his perspective, those who belong to to the, the, the Messiah have crucified the flesh and with his passions and desires. So these are not things that you need to give into. Instead, these are things that you are supposed to curb. So what I would say to them, is I, I, and I'm not unrealistic, I have grown, these are adults that have physical um have physical needs, but there are things that belong in context. And I, I know that, if you know, from listening to me, I'm pretty big on context. Um, passion is not what moves a holy covenant. There's a lot that goes into a holy covenant, and if you're motivated only by this physical need, then, the, the, then that's what your relationship is built on. It's built on that physical moment. And once that moment has passed, you still have to look at that man or that woman. So you need to have something else that you are involved in. If you know someone that you would consider um, having a covenant with, then what I would say to them is that when they are discussing um, how they feel for each other or if, if they are in, um, inspiring sexual kind of desires in one another, to have these conversations in such a way that says, you know, when, when we get married, I will be, it's going to be great to cuddle with you. Uh, I would love to be in your embrace when you become my husband, when you become my wife. And keep that marriage language on the table so that you understand that these passions belong in a particular context. In Second Timothy 3.6, he says that they, um, from among them are those who enter into household and take captive weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses. So Paul is not saying that your your impulses are are the impetus for getting married. He's saying these impulses need to be curbed, you know, and they belong within the context of marriage. And it's just bringing things contextually. Uh, uh, our brother Awar is very fond of saying that these these um these letters are supposed to be turning us back to the original core principle. The original core principle is that there's a there's a method and a protocol for marriage, none of which have anything to do with this one was lusting after the other. I just never met Rebecca. That they, that union had nothing to do with their desires for each other. It was Abraham who decided that Isaac needed to get married. It was not Isaac sitting around burning for nobody. That's not what it says. So, no, if some, when some when the sisters come to me, no, I do not tell them, well, since you are feeling hot in the drawers, what you need to do is get you a do right quick. That's absolutely Never my first thing to say. Instead, I would ask them to consider where those passions belong and ask them to put those in those, in those proper contexts. Because absolutely, they are natural. To desire a man is natural. For a man's desire to be with, with a woman is natural. So it's an also contextual. So for those reasons, even using the letters of Paul, I would have to say that impulse alone and passion alone is not what you build a marriage on. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was a, that was Sister Mayana um, bringing a fire just now on this very hot topic, I suppose. Um, Brother Sal, are you there? Is there anyone on the line who would like to jump in? Um, yeah, once again, people, I see a lot of people on the, the lines right now. The guy who's pressing number one and will add to the conversation. However, we have a lot of activity on social media uh, pertaining to this particular show. I see people, uh, <laughs> they comments and some questions. Actually, uh, some people actually on social media, on some of the groups, they're saying that um, some of the excuses that a lot of the men use for not being married is, uh, you know, how uh, you know they feel like they have to have more sexual experience in order to please their ladies. And some of the things I'm reading on social media, you know, they have to have indulge in other, uh, you know, engage with other women in order to, when they find their wife, they can really please their women. You know, I guess it's a male ego thing that's going on out there. A water swordsman, speak to the men out there when they, you know, when they, when they uh, mention those kind of things. Uh, there's probably some young boys out there saying that. <laughs> what do you want to say to that, uh, Wal? Yeah, yeah let, let me let me give a uh, understanding on what fornication, hormonging, and then I build from that. This is a uh, Ecclesiastes in Apocrypha 23 verse 16. It says, two sorts of men multiply sin." So it's talking about two sorts of men that multiply sin, right? And the third will bring wrath. A hot mind is as a burning fire. That's one type of man. A man with a with a temper. Okay, he multiplies sin. He go off the handle, beat people up. Then it says, it will never be quenched till it be consumed. Then it says, 
a fornicator in the body of his flesh will never cease till he has kindled a fire. So we're going to get understanding what a fornicator is, okay? It says, all bread is sweet to a whoremonger. See the metamorphosis? A fornicator and a whoremonger is the same thing. Then it says, uh, he will not leave off till he dies. Then it says, a man that breaks up wedlock. That's why I, in the beginning I went to the origin of true marriage. You lay with the woman, she's a virgin, you give her 50 shekels, that's your wife. The only thing supposed to separate you two is death. The men have broke that. They're just sleeping with this one, sleeping with that one. You know, she you know, our sons are doing it. The men are doing it. The old men are doing it. See, the most hard is about to put a stop to all that. Okay, look what he said about a man like that. It says, a man that brings a wedlock saying thus in his heart, who saved me? So the most high gives the inner thought of a man like that. Okay, it says, all, it says I am compassed about with darkness. The Lord convert me and nobody save me. What need I to fear? The most high will not remember my sins. Look, he, the most high gives us the mindset behind a guy like this. We all done it, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna hit that. And uh, man, no, man, I ain't gonna even call him no more. That's how. That's how a lot of us, you know, our, our young men, men, normal men, the old men, they roll it. Majority of our people are rolling like this, and that's why these plagues, these curses are cursing us. We gotta correct all this stuff, man. That's why you have a lot of uh, messed up families, uh, incest, all of this stuff because we're not keeping these statutes. Then it says. Uh, such a man only fears the eyes of man and knoweth not that the eyes of the Lord are 10,000 times brighter than the sun, beholding all the ways of men and concerning the most high secret parts. So the most high see what we are all doing. We're not getting away with nothing. Then it says, he knew all things ever they were created. So also after they were perfected, he looked upon them all. This man shall be punished in the streets. So you see a lot of sexual murders. That's why a lot of, I'm not, I was doing the inventory. A lot of these, these men that are um, our brothers and sisters that's killed on the streets, a lot of them have a lot to do with that fornication. One day, check it out. Okay? A lot of that fornication and all that immoral stuff, immor- immorality and all that kind of stuff, most high is killing us for this. That's why a lot of killing is going on. Okay? So, going back to what you said with that, men need to start being men. And marrying these women and be with them till death. And if you're not going to be with them like that, don't sleep with them. That's what I'm teaching my daughter. Okay? You don't give your cookie up to no man that's not going to be with you forever. We got to start teaching our kids that now, getting back in that vibration. But that's all I'm going to say on that. All right, Mona, you want to address those brothers out there that are saying uh, the reason why they're not marrying is because they want to get experienced sexually before they pick a wife. Go ahead. I mean, like, like, like I said, I think Brother Award just made some very, very valid points. We, we, ha- we have to reassess some of these excuses that are being used, and that's basically what it is. Um, as children of Israel who will struggle with the divine and man that has prevailed, we have to elevate ourselves, and that has always been one of Israel's issues. It's, it's vibrating on such a low frequency that we can't control our passions and lusts. We saw that in the wilderness when the brother was pimping through the place, you know, with a foreign woman right in the face of everybody. And it's like, what in the world is this? You know, and Pinkas has to do his thing. So this is not nothing new. You understand what I'm saying? But it is something that we have to identify and admit and elevate from. And it's an individual thing. It's a thing that you have to gain or regain control of your faculties and understand what things are made for. I think mm. that's one of the from my, from my experience, that's one of the major issues that we have because we're learning from the world. That excuse that is being used, Isaac, not Isaac, Jacob was 40 years old. You understand what I'm saying? Isaac was an older man. And what do you understand? To be a husband, instead of saying uh, to wind up, find out how to please your wife because you need experience, no, you need experience in how to go to work. You need experience in how to build a house. You need experience in how to sustain so that when you do have a wife, you can support the children that's going to become as a product of that relationship. So when our foreparents were getting experience on how to actually be a man, it, it is not a little boy can do that, and it's not to be mm. funny or 
diss anybody, but the reality is is that that is, like I keep saying, a lower vibrational thought process that we have to grow up out of. And it's not to say that the world doesn't want to keep you there. It's so real that everywhere you turn, this is the advertisement, this is the promotion, because they know that. And as people who say that we're Israel, we cannot use that excuse, the same excuse that someone who doesn't know is going to use. And when, right. when, like what uh, the brother just said, when we have these parameters that come back in place, when we have the accountability that's back in place, when we are teaching these children that that is not acceptable. Because when uh, we, we, we preach about the purity of, of, the, of the woman, but the purity of the seed of the man is very important. The quality of the seed of the man is very important because both are needed to procreate these righteous beings in the earth. So we really have to reassess everything that we're saying and not any longer make excuses. You understand? So we understand we're coming out of muck and the mire. We understand that we're coming from Harley Tree. The most I said it. Man, I'm going to send you to this place. You're going to be defiled there. But once you wake up, you understand, and you realize this is not acceptable and it's actually taking away from your from you, who you are, then, yeah, you might have to go sit on a minute to amass yourself and learn how to control yourself. You know what I'm saying? So definitely that's kind of what I would say to them. That's some stuff right there. And, that, you know, if you buy, if you're selling any buying it, then, you know, that's on you. But you already know, truth be truth, you can, you can do better than that, you know. Because if she don't know and you don't know, then what are you talking about? You both are going to go into that space. And I would just like to say once more, we're talking about marriage here and we're talking about burning and we're talking about lust. Right, like I said before, in my estimation, procreating in lust and burning without any controls is whatever spirit that you go into making a child. This is some of the metaphysics that we're not taught. You understand? This is why when somebody makes a song and they're angry, they go into the booth, you're going to get an angry song. Mm. If they're heartbroken, they go into the booth, you're going to get a heartbroken song. So what do we think about when we go into making a child? And we're putting all of our energy and our spirit in. What kind of child, what kind of spirit are we putting on that child? Mm. All of these things are to be considered. We need to go deeper and stop playing like the pagans and the heathens do. We need to elevate our mind process and do it step by step. So that's what I have to say. Uh, anybody else at this point? So. Anybody else want to chime in? Any other ladies? Got okay. I guess not. <laughs> uh, Mason, are you there? You want to chime in or that? Yes, I'm here. Um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the um, the uh, first book of Adam and Eve or not. It's one of the lost books, um, one of the ones that they actually hid. But um, a lot of people, when you read the first book of Adam and Eve, there was a, a part in that segment where a lot of people just assumed that Adam and Eve were made, and he and after they fell from the garden, he went right into, you know, came right into having sex with her. But that's not how that happened. Um, if you read that story, it actually tells you that Satan came and showed him a picture of the fallen actually having sex, and in it enticed lust within Adam's heart because prior to that he hadn't even touched Eve. He wasn't even there. The imagination or the the sexual desire was not there. And so when it happened, Adam started to be combative within himself about whether he should lay with Eve and have sex with her as what he saw the angels had presented to him or whether he could not touch her. But for fear of what would have happened, he went to the Most High and he asked him if he could have her, if he could take her as his wife, take her and have sexual relations with her. And the Most High told him, this is a thing that I did not put in you naturally, but because you've seen the thing that the, that, the, that Satan has showed you, he said that it has created you to have the, the, uh, the sexual desires, as he called the beast or the animals of the field. He said, and because of this, he said, I want you to fast. You and Eve shall fast, go into a spiritual fast for 40 days. He said, and after the 40 days is up, he said, I will he said, give unto her the frankincense and gold that I gave you. Go and give her the gold and go and give her the frankincense, he said, and present it to her, and then afterwards you may be able to lay with her. That was how it was done. So this lets me know that there was a sexual burning lust in Adam, so much so that he had to contend with himself and go to the Most High and pray about it and ask him if I could even touch this woman. 
because you have to realize they fell out of they fell out of paradise. There was no sex going on up in there in the heavens. None. When they fell out of the the, the, the garden of Eden, they brought them down. They became as flesh like the beast of the field. And so this lets me know that that burning passion was placed in him from the beginning. Yes, we know it came through Satan, but it's because now here's a man that was once this immortal creature has now become a mortal creature, and now he's become flesh. And because of his flesh crying out in a sexual desire, rather than act upon it, he went and consented with the Most High. And the Most High gave him permission to go ahead and sleep with her, and that's how they begin to, to conceive and make Adam, in the, I mean Cain and Abel and so forth. So this lets me know that even though we're thinking that this is a a a a lower you know a lower vibe or a lower frequency to operate on, because we are no longer immortal, our flesh still cries out for something. And rather than we allow our flesh to continue to yearn for this thing and fall into whoredom and fornication, this is why Paul says it's better to marry than to burn. With regard to, um, you know, I think that we we disagree about um, going into a a union, uh, a holy union, with the impetus being lust and, and passion in, in that regard. Um, I think that that's something that, because it is a holy convocation, has to come from a, a holy place and that it has to be a thoughtful place, and that it has to be a well-guarded. And, um, and I think that even in the, because in the, I have read the, the account that our sister has, has brought, and I think that even in, in her retelling of it, we find that uh, Adam doesn't immediately react on those impulses, and that there is a protocol that is, um, we find, being enacted. He first sat, he first Praise. He first exactly. seeks them the time. He does not react on this passion. And even then, this woman is his wife because she was created for him. And we know that from the beginning, the, the the command was to be fruitful and multiply. So it was always the intention that they would bring forth seed in, in, in that way, um, ex, you know, extend into their more, more immortality because the the opportunity to partake of the tree of life, which was, was, he was the only tree that they were not permitted to partake of was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life was still an option for them to obtain um, immoral, um, immorality in the way that which, uh, he had prescribed. But they forfeit that, that right. And so this other protocol comes into place, and we see the gifting of gold. And I think that's important. We see the, the gifting of gold. We see the, the, the frankincense. We see the, um, the incense are being burned. There's, a, there's a, a process that is being observed. There is no, wow, I really want to hit that. Let me do that because this is what we do, you know. Um, also in terms of, again, we, we see just in our, in the, what the Torah provides is that when a, a couple does finally have permission to marry, that man is not charged with work nor war for an entire year to make a woman happy. So the idea that he has to go and have this, um, this <laughs> he has to have a pre-show, he has to go through prep to um, get his game up before, you know, game night with his wife, that, that, uh, that's not rooted in, in scripture at all. We don't have any reason to believe that our forefathers had uh, you know, prep ladies, you know, to get them ready for game night. That's not what happens. If if she has no, if she is a, if she has no previous sexual experience, she doesn't know if you're good or not. Okay, she has no frame of reference. So you kicking game to her, saying, "Listen, I have to go and dip into four and five women first so I can get right for you." She doesn't know any different because she don't know no different. Your game is all the game she knows anyway. So you don't have to do that. So I think that. Presenting that particular argument to any woman it's just for a flat, just on logic. It's, it's not. If you don't know any better, your sex is the best sex he's ever had. So you don't have to go and and do all any of all of that. Because again, in Deuteronomy, in, in Torah, when that couple comes together, that couple stays together, get to know each other physically, spiritually, emotionally, they create those bonds together because it's the first time. 
that they're coming together, and they build that with each other. The the sexual connected. You understand? We're talking about sex like it's just physical. Every time you enter into another person's physical, I mean, you're entering into their physical body. Um, one of the sisters that I spend a lot of time with, she likes to liken um this particular union as to um when the priest enters the holy of holies, only one priest can enter to the holy of holies. And it, I think it's a really good analogy that this, that this one priest goes into this one space. It's not a, a series of priests coming into this one space. Only one priest at a time can go into this space. So this idea that you have to have um, all of this experience first, it, it, it's not rooted in Scripture. Like none of that is a, a Hebraic thought. What that comes from is uh, this idea that it is permissible for boys, for little boys, to go out and... Our culture will applaud a boy that has several women and will necessarily and correctly son a woman who is equal, who is who is that sexually permissive because it's not appropriate. Now we understand that for our little girls that we don't uh, we don't emphasize that in our little boys and that's problematic. So we have to stop um, emphasize. We have to stop allowing the the males to feel like this thing. Their seed isn't important. Like like my sister said, like that's not really your, your, the quality of the seed is is important. Your your male member is every bit as as uh, important as valuable as um as sacred as her modesty. So having these two come together, that's important. All the spirits that you 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 link up with when you have sex with all of those women, you are bond. You're, you're creating bonds with the, those women. You're creating a covenants, with, it's not not holy covenants, but you're creating connections with those people. And those connections are not in any way benefiting whoever your future wife is going to be. That in no way is, oh, oh I'm, I'm really grateful that you wouldn't have all of these sexual connections with all these other women, you know, yay, now our relationship is going to be great. What logic is that? Like who, 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 who does that? So in terms of having that particular argument, I would encourage women to, Think about not what sounds good, but what is good, and, and and consider the long run and what you're being told and what you are accepting not only into your mind and into your heart, but into your bodies. And likewise, our brothers, the things that they are accepting, that they are entering into these these spaces with these women who don't understand how precious they are and how important you are. This this idea of sex being just sex. Sex is not just sex. Sex is a huge part of connecting with another person. I don't think that can be emphasized enough. All right, we only have like about three minutes on the air, and once again, we had another powerful conversation on the relationship challenge today. Is it better to marry than to burn? I'm going to probably, uh, I, I see a couple questions, but I have only time maybe for one more on social media, and then we're going to pretty much get some last word from the special guests. Again, I see people on the phone lines. Do you have any quick comments you want to say? You know that number, 646-716-7320. But I see a question on social media. It says, um, what if this was your child? male or female, that pretty much was promiscuous, how would you advise them as a parent to get married? Uh, Let's go to uh, Amuna. Yeah, Amuna. I'm sorry, can you you come back with the question again? What if this was your child that was very promiscuous? How would you advise your child that they should get married? If the child was promiscuous, and then how would the parent um, advise yeah. the child? Yeah. In this space and time of knowing who they are, um, you know, at, it, 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 that for me, the child, whether it be male or female, like knowing what I know now, what, like what Sister Mayana just said, there's a lot of connections that people have made. There's, there's a level of detox. Uh, that one would have to go through for themselves to, you know, kind of sever these ties with these different spirits um, that they're connected with, especially in that promiscuity that you're going to pass on. You understand? So this, it's like for, for me, when, when Israel defiled the land, the most I kicked them off and said, now that land shall enjoy a Shabbat, you know. And so there's a space and time where you go through this cleansing and this purification, and really the child would have to be in alignment with the Creator, and then be led to, I wouldn't definitely not advise, hey, just jump out there and get married now. 
You understand what I'm saying? Because this thing is only going to, it's already starting off on a bad foot. It's going to end up worse. And so I would advise that child to be still and to, to, to allow themselves to be purified and to actually learn from the reasons why they fell into promiscuity. Because one thing I know, uh, it's a lot of topics tonight, but it, hopefully it all ties in, is that um, is that this is rooted in something. You understand what I'm saying? This is something deeper. When someone is promiscuous, when somebody is having a certain type of behavior, it may be rooted in um, lack of self-control. It may be rooted in abuse. It may be rooted in something that happened in their childhood, especially, I like to bring it back now, especially in this space and time. So, yes, the behavior. Yes, you condemn the behavior. This is not how we should be. But to actually help that individual to get to the root of the end, we have to understand what is this problem or this obsession that you have with sex. What is something, what is the inappropriate way, and why are you inappropriately expressing yourself that way? And help them to get to the root of that so going forward, because people could abuse um, sexual relations in marriage. So just marrying is is not necessarily going to help because they will bring and introduce other things that have nothing to do with holy covenant. You understand? So just not to go off topic, but that's off my head. This is some of the advice that I would get is that the child would need to um, to really get in touch spiritually with themselves, with the Creator, and get direction in that. Uh, by the way, uh, <clears throat> Sister Mason's call actually dropped. Hopefully, she call back for we're going to the overtime segment of the show. Uh, let's go to uh, Mayana Johnson. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I could you repeat the question, please? I'm sorry. I was just shocked. What was the question? Hello. Can you hear me? If the child <laughs> was promiscuous, if you had a child who was promiscuous, um, and sister, uh, sister Eunice said uh, good night to everyone. She had uh, texted me on on social media, so she said good night to everyone. Thank you for having her. But the question was, if the if you have a child and the child is promiscuous and the child wanted to get married, what would you advise them? Well, first, I want to say goodnight to the sister that um, has the party. Um, and, and in answer to the question, like, my daughter um, now is of marriage, uh, marriageable age, and I honestly, I would not know what to say to her if she had decided to go that path because she was raised in, in this way. So I can imagine that I, I wouldn't be patient with that at all because of all the time I've invested in teaching her what is right. Instead, you know, if you ever had the opportunity to talk to my daughter, she will tell you that she grew up with the, with me constantly telling her not to mess with my money. I always tell her, we go, don't mess with my money, don't mess with my money. <laughs> you know, your bar price falls every time you do something crazy. So I said, don't mess with my money. So my daughter would probably... My daughter hasn't been raised that way, has that on her brain that, you know, she doesn't, her her, uh, her decisions are informed from that, from this very Hebraic position. And, I, you know, I think I told you that you in a previous um, episode that, you know, some little boys decided to sniff around her outside of, the, uh, outside of the arrangement I had already made for her betrothal. And I told them, listen, you have to come through with 200 foreskins for me. David did it. I'm not saying I'm not playing, so I don't mess with my money. My daughter's bar price is my money. You don't, you don't mess with my money. That's how my daughter was raised. So she was raised to understand that she's of value. She's raised to understand that her, her modesty is tied to things other than her passions and her impulses. So the things that she does reflects not only on her but on me and on our father and, and on this culture. And every time she says she's an Israelite and she does something crazy, that affects on our nation. And that's a problem if she does something outside of that. So I think that um, Awar has done a really good job of emphasizing that, yeah, you know, we have to raise those coming behind us on what's right and, and not say, oh, well, you know, if you do something wrong, don't worry, we got all of these extra um, safeguards in place. You know, you do these things that are wrong. There are penalties in place. So my daughter was raised with that kind of thing. The most I said that the whole duty of man is to fear him. So my daughter has that fear. I think that our responsibility is to give our children both male and female kind of fear. Um, it seems to me that some of the men that, that are coming through with some of these doctrines, some of these opinions, are lacking fear. These women who feel like they can buck up against the system and buck up against the culture are also lacking fear. So what's important is that we raise our children with that sense of fear and respect for this culture, for our father, and for what needs to be done in all, in all modesty and all righteousness and all truth. 
Like the water sportsman? Good. Yeah, like the old saying go, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You know, all you can do, it depends on how, how old they are. They're an adult. You know, when they're living in my house, I'm gonna give them this. I'm gonna give them this work. You're gonna learn this, and you're gonna conduct yourself. And not only that, I have to walk in their life too. A lot of people, a lot of parents don't understand that. There's two ways to teach. You can give them the oral teaching from the scriptures, and then by your actions. Because I had, I had nieces. Nieces. Oh, they out of call. No. Hmm. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, I see I'm on a call actually dropping. If you went on a two-way, uh, you probably put add into the conversation. Uh, if you have a two-way, you can bring her in, uh, Mayana. If you have a two-way, you can probably bring her in. But go ahead, Owa. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying uh, I, had, I had nieces, and they all turned out real good and didn't go crazy because their mothers and their fathers were examples, you know. They moved in those righteous ways, and they watched that coming up. You know, sometimes you know. Now you really got to enforce these laws because these kids is crazy. These kids is crazy today, man. And you have so much temptation out here. You know, that's all I can say. You got to kind of go back to these laws and statutes and enforce it. If they don't want to listen, that's on them. You know. Hi, right, people. You know, this was another very powerful segment of uh, Debate Talk Funeral Relationship Challenge. Again, we're going to come back next Monday, next Monday, you know, and every, each and every Monday with another powerful topic when it comes to relationships. Uh, we're going to get some last words. Uh, again, uh, Muna, I don't know if she's about a uh, two-way right now, but her phone line dropped. So, uh, you know, we're going to pretty much wrap it up with some final words. Uh, Mayana, if you're there, you can uh, share some last words to the people out there. Go ahead. I, I, in my last, my closing thoughts, just to thank you again for allowing me to participate in the forum. I was trying to patch our sister and back into the conversation, but I'm not as tech savvy with this phone as I thought I was, so I'm not being very successful at the moment. Um, with that, I would like to say good night and shalom to to the family, and you know to thank um, Awa for for a great conversation again as always, and you sound for allowing me to participate in all of these really important conversations. Definitely appreciate appreciate you as well, Amayana, and uh, hopefully we we'll see you uh, next week as well. Uh, Water mm-hmm. Sportsman, any final words? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I want to thank you, bro, and the sisters that came on. And this is a great forum, and just hope you keep growing. All praise to the Most High and His Holy Son, and I hope this just keep growing and growing and growing, and uh, to create a great dialogue between us because this is uh, this is very necessary. We have a lot of problems among our people in their households, so this will, this will be a great uh, venue for the brothers and sisters to come up and and bring their understanding or have questions uh, and get them answered. So with that, say shalom to everybody in the Israelite world. Shalom. Uh, shalom. We appreciate you. And, again, if you guys have any topics, you know, you guys can actually hit up Amuna on uh, uh, Facebook, Amuna Yisrael, you know, send our inbox. If you have any particular topics you want to uh, for us to address on the panel, uh, send an email to debatetalkview at gmail.com. Let us know because we want to talk about things that people want to, you know, hear. And uh, we have a whole line of uh, topics already set up in the schedule already. And uh, I'm looking forward to all of the shows every Monday for the Relationship Challenge. Uh, actually, this week we don't have any more shows on the schedule, but you know how to be talk for you is you never know something might pop up so just keep it locked on blog talk radio go to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash debate talk for you but so far we have a clear schedule this entire week and then next week we're going to come back with about four shows so uh you know you got to keep it locked on the talk you radio again you never know we might surprise you with a, a show on the schedule uh on the blog talk all right guys so we're going to see you guys next time take care and y'all bless <laughs>
word.